Number 10, playing football. Considering football, soccer for my fellow North Americans, it's basically a religion in England, it's hard to imagine them ever having a world without it. But the football they played back in the day had far less rules and was a lot rougher on the players and the infrastructure. It could have an infinite number of players and could take part across an entire village. The goals were sometimes set miles apart and the game would often be used to settle disputes. So soon, actual brawls of tumbling, angry bodies would muck about with each other. But hey, according to the rules, you had to do everything you could to win. So if that meant punching a guy out or destroying a fruit cart, that's what you did. It also wasn't strictly football, you could use any part of your body. But the game became so damaging that King Edward II had to put a ban on it. It was causing too much injury and property damage. He forbade the games and condemned any who disobeyed to imprisonment. You'd think he would have just forced people to play by safer rules, not ban it all together, but oh well. It's back now! Number 9, Outrageous Men's Fashion. I finally found the reason as to why men's fashion has plateaued at the suit thing. I sense a colorful change in the wind nowadays though. But the last time they went really outrageous, they ended up getting punished for it. Medieval Europe was one of the most colorful periods of men's fashion to date. Anglo-Saxon men wore tunics, trousers, leggings, and strappy leather shoes tied together with belts and girdles. Oh, but that's not all. Oh, no, that's not all. Cod pieces were introduced later on. What is a cod piece, you ask? It was a piece of flair that men used to use to advertise their endowment, as it were. As you can suspect, they got quite big. As did their shoes. The longer the shoes, the richer you appeared, and the more pronounced the cod piece, well, I think you get the point. Men who wore pointier shoes had a higher social position. Some shoes were longer, anyways. But from 1337 onwards, laws were passed to preserve decency. No one was to wear a tunic that did not cover their buttocks or genitals. Offenders were fined 20 shillings, which was around 700 pounds today, or roughly $1,400 Canadian. Number eight, swans. This is actually a thing, and it has been since the 12th century England. It must be kind of weird just partly being born into the royal family, becoming queen and king, and being told, uh, yes, uh, you own all of England, and you own all the swans. What? Yes, you have to attend the swan upping. What the heck is that? Well, since the 12th century, the English crown has owned all wild, mute swans in open water. Over time, they allowed other select individuals to have some swans. These privileged individuals had to mark their bird to distinguish them from royalty, a tradition which continues today. The queen only exercises the right over wild, unmarked swans near the Thames. The royal swan upping is when all of the swans on the River Thames are counted, checked for their marks, and then released. The royal swan marker is currently David Parker, and apparently it's one of the queen's favorite things to do. That's adorable. Number seven. Medieval masks. Now, to go with laws that make no sense, there are punishments that also make no sense. There is a sweet satisfaction in seeing someone with egg all over their face, I'll admit. Which is why people in the Middle Ages like to serve out punishments that dealt out a good deal of embarrassment. Which is why, for non-violent crimes, people went all out. One comical form of punishment was making criminals wear terrifying masks that were terrifying to look at. They were either paraded around town or placed in the stocks to frighten babies and passerbys. They also made crime specific badges that you had to wear for the rest of your life. One such badge was a depiction of two huge red tongues, bigger than your hand, which indicated perjury. Good luck getting a date or a job with that one. Number six, Scold's Bridal. And with the theme of odd laws, we continue with some pretty weird punishments. This one also ties into a little one we're going to talk about later, see if you can guess. Don't scroll. The Scold's Bridal was a terrifying looking contraption that was built to punish women who ran their mouths. That's right, it was a crime as a woman to have an opinion, or to basically say anything anyone didn't like. They were largely designed to humiliate women who wore them, not to inflict any horrid pain, but there was a little bit. Just the shame though, that was the big thing. The bridles would be strapped onto the head with bits in the mouth like horses. The bits had spikes so it did hurt a little, but this would prevent the wearer from speaking. They were expected to parade around in this medieval headwear for 12 hours so that they would learn their lesson. And what makes all of this so much better is that you never have a second alone. If you haven't caught onto the theme here, yet it is plain and simple. Castle life meant cramped quarters. It took a lot of people to keep a castle running. There were cooks, cleaners, guards, personal servants, and of course all the royalty as well. Plus, the royals that lived in the castle extended past the nuclear family. It was their extended families as well. As a result, most of the rooms were multifunctional and the keep was the primary living space in the castle. Soldiers, servants, and even lords and ladies in waiting were expected to sleep in groups segregated by the sexes. For example, the women may have slept in bed chambers while the male servants, courtiers, and soldiers may have slept in the great hall. Even lords and ladies of castles often shared a room with a servant of the same sex. So why is that gross? Religious and royal obligation to reproduce. Also people without an obligation who would really like to do it anyway. As long as those people are married, you 
actually couldn't complain. In fact, it's weirder if you saw something and said something. So if everything stinks and you got next to no windows, how do you make a minty fresh castle? The simple answer is they didn't. Mold, insect, vermin, and disease were all part of everyday life in medieval times. Fresh water was precious and a reliable disinfectant was yet to be discovered. Eating a little bit of mold on your food or stepping in rooms with moldy walls were minor problems compared to actually finding enough food to eat and fighting off hungry wild animals like wolves or not dying of the plague or not being accused of witchcraft. There's bigger fish to fry. People in Norman and Tudor England lived short lives. If you reached the age of 40, you were considered old. Castles were very difficult to keep clean. There was no running water, so even simple washing tasks meant carrying lots of bucketfuls of water from a well or a stream. Few people had the luxury of being able to bathe regularly. The community back then was generally more tolerant of smell as a result. Inside the castle walls, floor coverings consisted of straw rushes and later sweet smelling herbs like lavender and mint. This could be swept away and replaced when it was of a noticeable point of filth. It was said that an ancient collection of beer, grease, fragments, bones, spittle, excrement of dogs and cats and everything that is nasty was seen when the soiled herbs were swept up and exchanged for fresh ones. But you know what doesn't help a castle? The smell of rotting corpses. Ah, luxury. There are heads of enemies cooking in the sun on spikes right outside your fresh air slit. There's the remains of a peasant shredded by mad dogs in the courtyard below. And someone is literally rotting just to your left in the wall. Castles were riddled with the dead. In the case of an oubliette, they were quite literally riddled. An oubliette is basically a little coffin cave thing dug into a wall where a particularly hated prisoner could be tossed in, bricked up, and completely forgotten about. Fittingly, oubliette comes from the French word oublier, which means to forget. Given some of the other medieval death options, I guess starving to death bricked into a rat infested hole wasn't the worst way to go. It still was way creepier to think that on any given day a castle had people rotting in its figurative basements and walls. Must have been for great ghost stories though, not great for the smell of their decomposing body quite literally wafting up through the floorboards later. Next up is how horrible it would have been to be a lady on the rack. So ladies have periods and they need some way to handle the men's seas mess without the feminine hygiene products we have today. This ain't the Victorian era where it was commonplace to weirdly free bleed everywhere. Medieval women preferred one of two choices. She could always catch the flow after it left her body or find a way to absorb it internally. In our modern words, medieval women could use a makeshift pad or a makeshift tampon. Pads were made of a scrap fabric or rag, thus the whole on the rag thing. Cotton was preferred because the material absorbs fluid better than the alternative wood, which not only repels liquid, but it's itchy and uncomfortable. Whether they made the choice of a homemade pad or homemade tampon, medieval women worried about leaks and stains. This is the main reason why red was a popular medieval petticoat color. The scarlet color was not only fashionable and decorative, but functional to disguise leaks. Now, the period ain't what's gross, it never is. It's what wealthy castle dwelling women could afford to block said period that was gross. A common type of bog moss found throughout medieval England, Sophagun simifibulolian, was a remarkably absorbent material. Ladies stuffed their homemade pads and tampons with it, and folks even used it as toilet paper or as battlefield dressing. The popular name for this moss is blood moss. Entomologists contend that this moniker comes from its use in battlefield first aid. This account, of course, oozes heroism and masculinity. In reality, it earned the name from being used in men's season, shoved up there. And definitely my favorite on the list today is protection wasn't just armor. One of the most interesting castle finds includes the protection discovered in Dudley Castle in 1885. Dating from the early 1600s, they're the earliest definitive physical evidence of the use of animal membrane jimmy hats in post medieval Europe. The enact deposits uncovered during excavations contained both domestic and organic remains of the occupying royalists who defended the castle under siege between 1642 and 1646. The keep's latrines had been sealed during the demolition of the castle's defenses in 1647. Examining further, scientists were able to determine that five blackened jimmy hats had been used and a further five non-blackened ones were presumably unused, all folded in on one another. The Department of Scientific Research at the British Museum boasts that their significance was magnified due to the nature of the find and the extraordinary archaeological cir circumstances in which they were found. Who might have used them is unknown, however the complexity of the manufacture must have made them relatively expensive, so perhaps the preserve of an officer class. It's known that officers wives were present during the royalist occupation, however this discovery definitely testifies this was neither 
the time nor place to pop out a kid. Stay safe and use protection, y'all. Kicking off the list at number 10, boiling. Whenever I get in a bath that's too hot, I think of the medieval times. I can't help it. I can't believe this was once a real thing. I get chills thinking about it. Either water or oil would be used for this ancient punishment. To die by being boiled, that was reserved for those who poisoned others. So if you have any vials of poison, toss it. Don't do it, man. Trust me. In 1531, the time King Henry VIII was running the show, they made boiling a capital punishment. So poisoning somebody back then was equal to treason. Therefore, it was agreed you should be boiled slowly in front of of like a room full of people. I would say that's the worst, but I know what's also to come on this list. Number nine, water. Taking a step away from the worst physical thing one could possibly go through, let's take a look at how far the mind will go before it too breaks. Sensory deprivation is still around today. In fact, there's many who pay for it. Yeah, they lie in a dark tub full of salt, then they float and listen to Childish Gambino. It's a magical experience. Your senses are powerful, especially combined with water. So this dripping machine, this old water punishment, that was just all bad. You had ice cold water dripping on your forehead and your face over and over for hours and hours. Drops would be at different random time so you can predict it as well. My toes are wiggling while I'm talking about this. This is making me anxious right now. In medieval times, they would tie you down and then using a horn, a big ass funnel, they would pour nine pints of water down into your, down your, down your throat. So water is horrible in many ways. Number eight, fire. Can't talk about medieval punishments without mentioning this witchy classic. Commonly practiced in Babylonia and ancient Israel, then later on in Europe with the classic witch hunts, burning at the stake didn't come from churches, like many believe. They didn't call the shots there at all. That was mainly how small towns settled local beef. Yeah, by burning at the stake, instead of just like a fist fight at the park. Burning at the stake came in full swing way back in 1431 in France. French disbelievers like Joan of Arc, they were burned at the stake. It was crazy that they actually did this as a form of punishment. This is one of the worst medieval punishments. And believe me, there's a little bit of a silver lining here. It was quicker than most. Sometimes. Gunpowder was sometimes used so that the burning and stuff would be much faster and brighter and louder and much more horrible. A lot worse on paper, but a lot faster. So honestly, I think it's better. History is insane. Another red hot punishment used in medieval times was when the accused had to hold a red hot iron bar and then walk a few steps with it. A red hot iron bar, your hands were literally toast at that point. Here's where it gets even worse though. Three days later, the accused would come back to the court and then when the bandages were removed, if their hands were healing, they started to heal, they were deemed innocent. They were on the path to goodness and whatever. If their hands were still in horrible condition from say, I don't know, holding a red hot iron bar, then they were pronounced guilty. That's how the courts worked back then. Number seven, the rack. On to something not so hot and fast, but rather dull and slow, the rack is surprisingly well known. It was originally introduced to the Tower of London around 1420. The Duke of Exeter referred to this device as his daughter. What a weirdo. It's like guys who call their car like she. It's like, okay, just a little bit too close to your automobile, man. Relax. It was an open bed frame type device where your ankles were tied at the bottom and your hands were tied at the top. Already we're off to a horrible start. It was horizontal as well and sometimes it was up. It was, it was all bad. It would just leave you hanging by these ropes and these ropes were slowly tightened more and more, obviously causing some problems to muscles and joints that were, you know, holding things in place. This was done to extract information. This is also one of the worst things I've heard. Even getting tickled like this would be horrible. I couldn't even imagine. I make jokes because I'm uncomfortable, honestly. Hit that thumbs up to spread some good vibes because we're not even halfway done, folks. Number six, molten metal. This was another form of capital punishment, and if you've seen Game of Thrones, it'll ring a familiar bell. A few of these do, actually, yikes. Metal would be heated up in a cauldron for a long, long time to the point where it was liquid, it was molten metal, just a soup of minerals. Look, we said this video wasn't for the faint-hearted, and here at Bumblebee, we like to keep that promise. They would then pour the molten metal on your head, or more commonly known, this would they pour it down the throat of the accused. Obviously, it wasn't done as a method to extract information, it was done to brutally end someone's life. Because they're not talking after that, of course. Execution by molten metal was supposedly done to a wealthy Roman general, Marcus Licinius Crassus, back in ancient times. The metal would burn your muscles and skin, literally cooking it, and then after a few moments, it would harden. Bad, bad, not good. So they colonize half the world for spices, but aren't the best at using them. It's sugar and spice and not so nice sauce. Spices were stupid. 
bit expensive because Western Europe isn't exactly known for fiery flora or flavorful plants. And the only real means of transportation tended to die if you rode them too far, horses. So obviously you're just getting rare bits of dried herb brought back from crusades that you also have no idea what it is or how to use, and that's only if you're wealthy too. A lot of recipes described the peasants and even the wealthy seasonings as vinegar, ginger, garlic, chopped bread, unripe apples, and almond milks. AKA most people were limited to flavoring their foods with whatever BS they had lying around. Mostly the tart or sour, leading to the modern British tradition of refusing to eat food that actually tastes like anything. Like spices, sugar was so expensive that it blackened rotten teeth became a status symbol. It was so coveted that when it finally became cheaper and more accessible to the average person in the 16th century, people went nuts. They were rolling meat in it, vegetables, and probably themselves. People tried to liven up their bland ass food with sauces, but the limited access to dairy and tomatoes were still a twinkle in the eyes of the colonizers. And these sauces, they weren't the sort of thing you'd want to dip your pizza rolls in as a result. At the beginning of the medieval period, sauces were based on milk or wine or butter, or simply the au jus which emerged as part of the cooking process. Because bread was so important to the overall caloric intake and to maintaining the consistent mold and food poisoning that was killing them all, flour could not be wasted to prepare sauces and gravies, except on the tables of the rich. Their sauces were more like oatmeal, which you'd only serve on vegetables today if you want to ruin them. To give you an idea, one sauce is gruel, it's pounded oatmeal mixed with broth. Oh man, what a treat. Next up is beaver tails, but not the bannock type. Usually saying beaver tail, you think of that sweet, fluffy fried dough covered in sugar, maybe ice cream that's found at carnivals or amusement parks, or that hometown restaurant that sells them for $6.50 even though they're the size of your head. But medieval beaver tail? Whole different animal. Wait, well, whatever. Anyways, as discussed, medieval peasants were fasting like three fourths of the year. That's a long time. So the church compromised by simply forbidding people to eat meat during fasting holidays and then compromised further by agreeing fish isn't meat. But why stop there? People went even further by deciding certain parts of animals found in water that kind of looked like a fish, like a beaver's tail, counted as fish. Beaver tails were similar in shape to flatfish if you used your imagination. They looked like they were covered in scales and they spent a lot of time underwater, therefore they're actually fish. And they provided a cheap stand in for the country's fishless poorer masses. But again, why stop there? The 17th century was no longer just the tail that was allowed on fast days, but the whole beaver itself. The beaver was a fish due to the fact it was an excellent swimmer. Unsurprisingly, the 17th century is the same year the beaver goes extinct thanks to overconsumption. Now the beaver is thriving once more again in England, Wales, and Scotland thanks to su successful reintroduction programs from Canada, cause we stay carrying that team. A medieval peasant walks into a bar and orders a drink, and has to correct the bartender because they ordered a cock ale, not a cocktail. This hilariously named beer was made by tossing a boiled and crushed dead cockerel with four pounds of raisins, nutmeg, mace, and a half pound of dates inside a canvas bag. The bag was then placed in ale and left there to steep for six or seven days. It was then bottled and kept still for a month, after which ready for consumption. This was the most popular recipe as shared in a 1669 news article by Kelnan Digby. Why was this done to beer when it was already medieval times and it tasted bad enough? Well, it wasn't to produce dead chicken flavored beer, which is why strong herbs were there to overpower the chicken. The reason for ruining perfectly good beer with a giant chicken tea bag stemmed from the belief that the beer would be imparted with the cockerel's characteristics of strength, vigor, and courage. It was therefore mainly drunk by big manly men who wanted to be even bigger and even more manly. It was described as a pleasant drink, said to be provocative, aka it excited lust and aroused the body. In 19th century dictionary slang, cock ale was directly identified as a homely aphrodisiac. However, it naturally fell out of favor eventually for beer that didn't taste like dead chickens. I'm super angry about this one, but apparently it was only done in times of serious famine. It's roast cat. cat Cats were considered highly useful in keeping pests and vermin away. Dogs weren't so much of a commonplace thing and usually they were the first to be eaten pet wise when it came to serious food shortages. However, if the going gets tough, you have the option of hunting down some ferals in the woods to feed the fam. So ever wonder how to roast a cat? According to one medieval recipe, you start off by cutting off the head and tossing it away because it is not for eating. They, for they say that eating the brains will cause him who eats them to lose his senses and judgment. Then you do the cleaning, at this stage the feline may look ready to roast, but alas, 
You must first bury it in the ground for a day and a night before you do. Then you unbury it, spit it, roast it, and whip it with a green stick. You can serve the roasted cat by soaking it in broth and garlic. To quote the end of the recipe, and you may eat it because it is very good food, which I feel like they threw in because they knew folks were not sold on eating dead ground food. And of course, what better to end this list than literal garbage? A real, literal actual name for a medieval dish. The historical food blogs are fighting for their lives to try and say this recipe is super tasty. And they've used the old recipe to make it at home. I do not believe you. I will die on this hill. This is probably the worst titled dish in history, and its ingredient list does not improve it. I have found four recipes, and each is just worse than the rest, all going as far back as 1393. So most generically, you're gonna need all the worst parts of a chicken. You need the head, the, the livers, the gizzards. Throw them into a nice pot. Add fresh beef broth, powdered pepper, cinnamon, cloves, mace, parsley, sage, all chopped small. Then take bread, like actual bread. Just take a whole loaf and just put that in the pot. Boil it, then put it through a strainer, then boil it again. Add powdered ginger, verjuice, which is unripe apple juice, mmm, salt, and a little saffron. Then serve it forth. To have it English style means leaving the pieces of animal and chunks in there. When you serve it, having it French style is to strain it once more and serve it just as a thin broth. Imagine making it brothy soup style, serving that to your buddies before telling them afterwards what they ate. At number 10, baby night. I know that when someone asks a little kid what they want to be when they grow up, some of them might respond with saying something like a princess or a cowboy or a knight. But back in the medieval age, kids were really becoming knights, not just when they grew up. Knights started training when they were between the ages of 7 and 10, so their childhoods were pretty short lived. In this day and age, kids that age are starting elementary school and are still too short to ride most rides at the theme park, but back in the day, they were being trained to go off to war. Sounds like a pretty sucky situation but it gets even worse when you realize that most of these young knights didn't even get a choice in the matter. Parents back then controlled what their kids' futures were going to look like, and there was nothing that their kids could do or say about it, so if they were to be trained as a knight and go off to war, that's exactly what was going to happen. At number 9, Squires. Now even though kids as young as 7 years old would be shipped off to train as a knight, luckily no one was going to send these kids out into battle just yet. Before they could even think about seeing the battlefield, they had to go through training. First they started off as pages. The pages mostly did menial tasks like working in the stables and serving food to the knights, but they also learned to ride horses and use a sword. A few years later, when they were about 14 years old, they would graduate to become a squire where they were assigned to a specific knight, sort of like an assistant. The squire would do some pretty menial tasks for their assigned knight, and they would clean and polish the knight's armor and sword, tend to the knight's horse, and help the knight get into their armor for battle. Most squires got through these tasks with the dream that one day they would become a knight themselves and have a squire of their own, but unfortunately in some cases, some squires never became knights and they stayed a squire even past the age of 18 when most squires would become knights. Seems a little unfair to me, but I guess in that case you wouldn't be burdened with the knowledge that you could die on the battlefield since you would never make it there. Before we continue learning about medieval knights and how messed up their lives were, why not consider leaving a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and maybe also consider smashing that subscribe button as well to see more videos like this one. At number 8, training. When you picture what it would look like to see squires training, what do you imagine? Do you picture kids fighting with wooden swords or practicing how to put on armor? Well, you can put that out of your mind because that image is more sunshine and rainbows than what actually went on because training to be a knight was a very grueling process. When a page graduated to become a squire, they then had to master the seven points of agility. The seven points of agility were sort of like sports that would help the squires become good knights. They had to master shooting, fencing, wrestling, riding horses, swimming and diving, climbing, long jumping, and tournament sports like jousting and dancing. Yes, that is more than seven, but let's just agree that medieval math was flawed and not think about it too hard. Other than the physical skills that they had to master, squires also had to learn how to recite poetry, hunt, play chess, and impress the ladies because even though they were going to be slaying people on the battlefield, they still needed to be able to win a woman's heart. Unfortunately, even with all of this training, many young knights died in their first battles, but at least they tried their best, right? At number seven, too much poop. Here's a real downside to being a knight in the medieval era. 
While we've been taught that knights were these amazing, brave, chivalrous men that would rescue a princess and live happily ever after, the reality is that they were actually a bunch of dudes on a muddy battlefield with poor hygiene that were literally pooping themselves to death. Many knights who embarked on crusades had a lot of parasites and diseases, and one illness that proved most problematic was dysentery. Dysentery is an illness that basically causes super poops due to a parasite. So these knights were out trying to win back the holy lands while their tum tums were throwing up gang signs getting mad rumbly on the battlefield. It is believed that these knights contracted dysentery through drinking tainted water, and because medicine was basically a myth at this point, once you contracted dysentery, you could basically kiss your life goodbye and your stomach contents goodbye. The most famous case of death by butt explosion was from the Seventh Crusade, where Louis the Ninth had contracted dysentery and had his pants cut because he was tired of having to pull them down every time he felt a rumbly in his tumbly. This all sounds like such a horrible way to go and a serious downside to being a knight. At number six, armor. We all have a pretty good idea of what knights looked like, right? The shiny metal armor, the chain mail and helmet. Well, as cool as they may have looked, the armor that knights wore was actually pretty impractical when it came to agility because there was just no way you could move very easily when wearing it. These knights had to carry around a lot of weight. Hollywood made us believe that swords that knights used were incredibly heavy, but in reality they only weighed about 3-5 to five pounds. Yeah, they were pretty hefty, but nowhere near the kind of weight that knights were carrying on their bodies because of their armor. The average medieval suit of armor weighed between 45 and 55 pounds, and just the helmet alone weighed 4-8 to eight pounds. Knights on the battlefield had to worry about fighting, staying alive, and carrying an extra 45 pounds on them, but knights who jousted had it even worse because their armor was known to weigh twice as much as battle armor. These knights had to be very strong in order to carry that around, otherwise they would have collapsed under the weight of their gear when they got too tired to keep going. And speaking of Christianity, how about a church position called the Sluggard Wakers? Which is quite the name. Guess the only thing worse for the church's holy sanctuary than dangerous stray dogs was the presence of conked out parishioners. Sluggard Wakers were volunteers that patrolled the pews and ensured that none of the congregation was falling asleep when they should be praising their Lord. They were literally Jesus snitches. If you were caught dozing off during the service, the sluggard waker had the sacred duty to wallop you on the head, and not lightly. The sleeper usually clobbered with something like a club, a rod, or a switch bundle. Some of the more aggressive sluggard wakers used forks or brass tip staffs or metal knobs to do the job. The sting of rebuke was supposed to wake you and remind you to remain awake and vigilant for your lord. Jesus wasn't sleeping on you, now is he? No. Some sluggard wakers were volunteer members of the congregation. Some wakers were members of the church staff, such as the parish clerk. Other wakers were also knock nobblers because when there were no dogs to drive off, there were likely congregants to wake up. I should probably explain all the dogs in church talk I'd be doing, so knock nobblers are next. Medieval Europeans lived in filth. Their structures all sucked and so did their economy. Does it really surprise you that the church would just have its doors wide open? Does it really surprise you if they didn't have windows? Of course animals can get in, so knock nobblers had the unique unique task of chasing wild dogs out of the church to protect the congregation, especially the priest who's most at risk while holding the full loaves of bread for service. Elderly men holding warm loaves of bread were probably some very easy prey for a hungry, unscrupulous wild dog. And as someone who survived being mauled by a dog, the terrifying reality is once they're on you, it can be incredibly difficult to get them off. So this job would actually be super necessary. Always remember, protect the face and neck. So a novel knocker was given a whip and a pair of dog tongs. The whip was used just to scare the dogs away, the tongue was used to clasp the animal from a safe distance so they could be removed from property. Their methods and ideology were the precursors to modern animal control departments and their tools. Knock nobblers didn't stop there though. If wild dogs weren't running around, they would instead turn their attention to unruly and disobedient children. If scolding didn't work, the knock nobbler would remove the child from service too. The amount of avoidable child screaming I've heard at a synagogue? Yo, I feel like we should just bring this back. I love this job. Before the phone book, the pocketbook, a Blackberry, or even gasp apple, was the nomenclator. We all know the person, or are the person, who cannot remember names or dates to save their literal life. If that is the case, you'd be better suited hiring one of these guys rather than working as one. Nomenclators were serfs tasked with remembering other people's names, status, and important impressive details for their lords at public events. This way you aren't carrying a quill and parchment around for reference, and imagine how much more impressive it is to, for the fair damsels that you remember her address and her father's companies just like that. 
Or well, at least the dude standing next to you does for you, but whatever. Sometimes the nomenclator's job would be hiked up a notch and they would have to remember more information for their master because homeboy got drunk or zooted. it. This could be details from prior conversations, plans to meet someone somewhere, things they've lied about and now you have to upkeep for them. Even just basic information about the individuals your master has been speaking to throughout the evening. Essentially, Norman Clatters were phone books before it was cool and embarrassment prevention babysitters. No better thing to title it, so let's just call it by its name, Piss Prophet. The Piss Prophet, also called a water scryger because oh, that's so much better, was a doctor who diagnosed disease from the sight, smell, and taste of a patient's urine. This term seems to originate from the 1600s, but the profession itself dates back to the medieval era. Now I gotta play devil's advocate a little bit because scientifically this isn't quite as insane as it sounds. Some conditions can really be diagnosed with urine alone, such as diabetes, which makes urine sweet. And as we would all know, dehydration causes strong dark colored urine, and UTIs can leave blood in urine. If you and I can recognize at least two of those things from sight without our doctor present, it's not totally gross that they give it a little dip and a lick. <laughs> and now we're cutting the crossroads. Hey, so want to hear a fun sentence? Samurai sometimes tested swords by attacking random passerbys. Yeah, so in medieval Japan, it was considered dishonorable if a samurai sword couldn't cut through an opponent's body in one stroke. It was important then for a samurai to know about the quality of his weapon, so every new sword he got had to be tested before he took into battle. Naturally, it's got to be a realistic test too. So samurai mostly practiced this through and through cut style on corpses or on criminals. That's normal, kind of what you would expect, but corpses need to be whole in their culture, so not many people wanted to just offer theirs up for the chop chop. And well, Japan has some efficient execution methods that were a lot more painful and slow for the criminals and taught the public a lot more. So you would never guess what the method was lined up to fill that void instead and somehow legally approved, condoned, and excused as a ceremonial way to go. Sujigiri translated means crossroad killing because the targets were random everyday commoners who were minding their own business and happened to need to walk through an intersection at night the way that we all do at some point. And samurai would quite literally chop these people down. Bodies would be found by others or in the early morning and there was never anyone to blame and you technically couldn't be angry or seek revenge. This was government approved and sanctioned activity. Incidents of sujigiri were rare in the early medieval period but began to pick up in the 1200s when more sociopathic or psychopathic samurai started to, pun intended, overkill it. By the warring states period, the end of the medieval area, sujigiri became a dishonorable act. Samurai and kabuki Kimono rogues turned into a horrific popular pastime. In fact, one Edo era report from the year 1600 details the early years of the period, claiming that people were killed in Tsujigiri every night on certain crossroads in what's now modern day Tokyo. This continued to escalate, so the authorities felt they had to ban it in 1602, only a few decades after the medieval period finally ended. With scalps so oily they could star in grease, it's no wonder lice was everywhere. You know what? I will give them a little bit more credit. It is true after a certain point of not using shampoo, even the straightest of thin hair can regulate its oil levels. So their scalps probably weren't the worst, but maybe they were rocking some hella dandruff. Also, as I mentioned, lice. Say you're somehow living a medieval life healthily, being whatever you are in the castle. You're making a living, you're not sick, and nobody wants to tie you to a chair and dunk you underwater. Even if you've managed that, you still have lice. Bugs were everywhere, man, all kinds of them. All on you, in your room, in your food, nowhere was safe. Lice was such a way of life that people treated appointments to get deloused in pretty much the same way people treat appointments for a haircut today. Maybe an exaggeration, but you get what I mean. People in the Middle Ages and medieval times took lice to their grave, living a life of itch, 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 itch. No one likes having rats and mice in their house. Unfortunately for castle dwellers, the dark, cold living quarters within the castle afforded the perfect breeding ground and lifestyle for plenty of rodents and bugs, carrying diseases that could have meant the end for any of the castle's residents. Name something grosser than a non-ventilated stone behemoth full of unwashed bodies. So why no washy washy of the body body? Why is that so difficult to accomplish? Jump in a river or something, right? Wrong. Leeches, disease, death. Also, hot baths are preferred. Regular and incredibly convenient bathing as we know it today did not exist in Europe until the late 19th century, so Europeans in the 13th, 14th, and 
1800s were not vibing with that idea. Firstly, water was precious, especially during sieges, and the work was so hard and manual and labor intensive that you would build up a sweat the moment you got out of the bathtub. So bathing was seen as a waste of time. I mean, wash off two weeks worth of grime and one little batch of sweat made that a waste. Your bath water is probably brown, dude. Still seems kind of worth it. But secondly, the trouble of setting up a bath just didn't seem to be worth it. No running water, so if you wanted a hot bath, you had to boil the water yourself over a fire, carry hot water buckets upstairs to the bathtub, fill the bathtub and not spill the hot water on yourself, get the temperature right, put the soap in if you had any, get in, wash before it cooled, get out, dry, put your clothes back on, and then you have to bail out the entire bathtub by hand with a bucket and find a window to toss the water out of onto some unsuspecting servant. So yeah, it was a lot of work. And what of feces? What do these highly civilized, highly sanitary individuals have to offer us for the call of nature? The modern toilet didn't exist back in the 14th century. Instead, you either had a closed stool, which was a special seat with a bucket underneath, or you used a privy, which is a seat with a hole in it. So why not call them the same thing. Whatever, medieval people. Waste going through the clothes stool, which by the way is where we get the feces nickname stool, was collected in the bucket, which was then removed, emptied, washed, and replaced. Waste that passed through the seat of a privy, which was the early kind of toilet, ended up in one of two places. If the castle had a moat around it, the waste probably would have gone in there. If it didn't have a moat, or if the privy was located somewhere without access to water, bodily waste ended up in a cesspit at the very bottom of the castle. But anyways, check out what some of the privies looked like. From what I gathered reading, there really were some castles without designated rooms for these. Just could find them in random hallways in case you want to whip it out and take a leak right there. At Paravril Castle, you often find privies high up in the wall, high above the smell and safe from attackers who might use the literal crap hole to get into the castle like a reverse Shawshank escape. The most famous example of this allegedly took place during the siege of Chateau Galliard in 1204. Talk about a crappy job, it's the royal bleep shoveler. You know the word, it rhymes. So, pit, the medieval crap dungeon thing. Though medieval people didn't know about germs, they believed bad smells caused illnesses, meaning when the stank started wafting up a little too hard, one unfortunate man would have to clean it out. Like rich people nowadays scheduling a maid, whenever this dude showed up, everyone in the castle would hightail it out so as to not have to interact. The gong farmer would shovel the poop into baskets and wheelbarrows and take it off to bury or spread on fields as fertilizer for the food they ate. Gong farming could be dangerous. In 1325, Richard the Raker fell into a cesspit and drowned. Say goodbye to sinus and sense of smell as the acids cook that out of you. And stay away from the infectious bacteria literally everywhere. However, gong farmers were quite well paid despite people not wanting to ever get close to them due to their smell. Rest assured though, because castle logic was that closets and toilets are one of the same. The private castle privy was always sharing the same space as the residents stowed away personal belongings and a room called garter robes. Obviously, you can see this is a stepping stone to a wardrobe being a sequestered small offshoot room. Inside the garter robe was also a toilet hole next to your Sunday best. Logic dictated clothes should be kept close to the toilet to prevent insects from damaging them. The idea being that the odor would act as a deterrent for insects. Fecal odor. Okay. Number five, rat catcher. As the name hints towards, rat catchers are one of the worst jobs you can have in and around a castle. It's an important role, of course, like being a fool or a literal walking, talking toilet, which I'll get into later, but there needs to be a chasseur de rats. Chasseur de rats. I'm just gonna start calling myself that. Back in those times, rats and mice were the leading source of spreading disease. They didn't have city buses or you know, people walking around throwing bottles. And with these castles being big and dark, they were probably full of rats. Black rats were a common household problem, yuck. So in comes the well-respected rat catcher. These guys would sometimes try and use spells to get rid of rats. Wouldn't work really too well, but more often than not, that didn't work, so poison powders were the main trick of the trade. The most famous you've probably heard of is the Pied Piper. He visited Germany, he arrived in the small town, and rumor has it this guy used a flute to drive all the rats just into the river. He just, hmm, he does a musical performance and then exterminates all of your pests. If anything, he should be getting a bonus, but rather the town insists they weren't even gonna pay him, so he used his flute to make everybody just go away and leave the town forever. What an OG. He's like, you don't wanna pay me? No sweat. <gasps> Number four, the Crusades. Just imagine this, thick, 
heavy metal armor reflecting the heat from the sun back against you as you chug along the desert. Despite being in the holy land, this certainly sounds like hell. As I mentioned earlier, men were expected to go to war when called, even if they had no training or skill and like maybe knew how to use a toothpick but had no idea what a sword was. For many, it was a death sentence and the first crusades were particularly brutal um, because you weren't only being called to war because of, you know, honor, but you were being called to war because it was a religious thing. Getting there was awful in the first place, you might not even make the voyage. Then marches through the desert were long and hot with soldiers constantly at odds with starvation, dehydration, disease, infection, the elements, and then of course, a spontaneous attack from the enemy. So like you're exhausted and all of a sudden you have to be like, huh, fighting somebody to save your life. There are even stories of some of them boiling shoe leather to eat it because they had nothing else. And after what we know of tanning, ugh, many crusaders justified their suffering as a part of the spiritual journey. So if you did fall ill to disease, you were just kind of left by the side of the road to die alone. Number three, groom of the stool. Nowadays, assistants grab your coffee for you, maybe they answer some phone calls, keep the business running while you're off doing your other business stuff. Assistants are vital. The groom of the stool was quite vital when it came to the king. Created by King Henry VIII, the role was to assist the king's bowel movements. Yeah, you had just a box with you that you carried at all times, little opening lid, smelled horrible, and you would literally follow the king until he needed to use you. Yeah, porta potties weren't a thing, and there's no way you're going to catch a king in the woods. In fact, you won't even catch a king wiping his own behind. That was also reserved for the groom of the stool. Lucky you. And this stool, you would have water, towels, a wash bowl, the whole setup. And you're probably thinking, Taylor, which poor soul had to be stuck with this role? What must you have done to deserve such a punishment? Well, this is the job you wanted, really. Only sons of noblemen could take on this role. And in doing so, they also gain access to every room, tons of nice clothes, any bedchamber furnishings, and of course, a high pay, yeah. I would say this is the craziest job on this list, but it's really not. Number two, the executioner. A man named Franz Schmidt meticulously chronicled his life as an executioner in detail. And well, as you can guess, it's not it's not a fun one, but there was a lot of humanity behind it too. He had to start practicing on pumpkins at first, then graduate to live animals, and then humans. Who would choose a role like this? Well, though legally the role wasn't hereditary, it pretty much was by expectation and blood. The job was passed from eldest son to eldest son with other sons being trained to fill vacancies. Daughters of executioners married sons of executioners so the position would continue. As most people saw this as a pretty undesirable profession, it was difficult to keep anyone at their post, so the job fell to the men who inherited the axe as it were. So. Not legally, but it was. This cycle of executioners created something called executioner dynasties across Europe. The existence of these dynasties meant that men were trapped in this cycle of employment and had few other opportunities to work. It also meant you had a very lonely life, as people who associated with death weren't people anyone liked to hang around. And number one, the gong farmer. The Gong Farmer, of course we had to end on this one as it's definitely the most crappy of the list. Medieval washrooms are just horrible, they're not really a thing, they didn't have the sanitation techniques that we have today. Stuff would often pile up within the castle walls and over time it would smell worse and worse. You can only imagine. The Rat Trapper would be around this area too, I'm assuming, so maybe they would see each other and fist bump and be like, hey our jobs suck, nice, let's do it, get that bread. So these respected gong farmers, they would come in and take the bad stuff away from the castle. They were crap commuters, essentially. These cesspits were usually in the bottom of the castle, the lowest level, because you know how gravity and things work. These guys would go in and dig through years of yuck, piles of it, just moving all day long back and forth out of the castle. They too were paid well, really well obviously, but a lot of these gong farmers got sick. A good number of them just wouldn't come out of those pits. Pretty horrible, right? And on top of that, people didn't like talking to them. Their job wasn't cool like the guy who takes heads. Head and shoulders also didn't exist back then. They didn't smell the best. They were often just kind of eh, and they crossed the street. It was sad. It was all bad. Hashtag all bad. Such as the forbidden omelette. It's not really an omelette actually, it's more like if you cut a pancake-like slab out of the color canary yellow. Back 
back in medieval times, Lent and the other billion days they spent fasting were a miserable affair where Christians ate like lentils and dried fish every day for a month. The English came up with a solution for this tiresome diet, the tansy, a sweet and savory dish that was somewhere between a pancake and a vegan omelette. Tansies took their name from the tantatum vulgar herb that grew across the country at that time in great abundance. Eventually a lot more ingredients were added to tansies such as parsley, feverfew, almonds, breadcrumbs, nutmeg, cream, and butter. Ironically, despite the love of tansies and the fact this plant was used to treat medical ailments, it was later discovered to be poisonous. Dangerous to consume, rub on skin, the whole nine yards of poison. Hilariously, that did not stop the English from quite literally driving it to extinction. No more tansies now. And what could possibly be more tasty than something that you can make laxatives out of, perfume, and car oil? It's whale vomit. Ambergris is often considered as one of the world's strangest natural occurrences, and it's been used as an ingredient in food and drink alone for hundreds of years. Europeans used ambergris as medication for headaches, colds, epilepsy, and other ailments. The first reported use of ambergris in perfumery comes from Muslim Spain. It has been used for flavoring everything from cigarettes to Turkish coffee and even hot chocolate. If you like the TV show Bob's Burgers, you may know it from their episode titled as such, where the kids find a big old chunk of it washed up ashore in their wharf town. Something that does still happen nowadays, so keep your eye out for what looks like a giant chunk of earwax at the beach. Formed in the intestinal tracts of sperm whales over decades, ambergris is a grayish brown waxy substance that some scientists believe is produced by whales to help ease the passage of objects they have eaten that they can't digest before expelling the same way whales expel fecal waste. Usually found floating in the sea or washed up on beaches, ambergris has not only been the foodstuff of choice for royalty, but it's also been a firm favorite of the perfume industry even today thanks to its strong and lingering scent. Nowadays, ambergris has fallen out of favor as a food additive, possibly because people found out what it does and where it came from, but it's still used in the perfume industry apart from in countries where it's banned, such as Australia and the United States. Another absolutely bizarre natural occurrence they enjoyed was the openars, the rudest entry on this list by a country mile. Openars were actually a commonly consumed variety of apple in medieval ages, and they do not look appetizing. What is that? It looks like a Photoshop project of a potato, persimmon, and a crab apple put together. I would say don't judge a book by its cover, but the inside is an effing mess too. Look at that. Who thought that was edible? Who said, look, that looks tasty. Give me a bite. Literally has the composition of a moldy peach. According to the interwebs, the apple got its rather vulgar nickname from its appearance of the underside. The calces, which normally look like this on an apple, are very large, and they're spread apart on an open arse, giving the underside of an apple a distinctly certain exit human appearance. Somehow, looking like that and being still called an open arse, the apple managed to pick up popularity in the 13th century and remain popular for cooking well into the 17th. Dying of fever or just in the mood for an inconvenient hard to cook dish, well you may want to consider roast rodent. Those little roly polies, hedgehogs were considered a cure for everything from sore throat to leprosy. Their fat and intestines were considered the most viable. Hedgehogs may seem like an unlikely source of nourishment for us today, not just because of their prickly spines, yet their quills didn't deter determined chefs of the past globally, especially in medieval times when they prepared roasted hedgehogs by gutting and trussing them just like pullets. The hedgehogs were then roasted and then only after they were pressed in a towel to dry and served with cameline sauce or wrapped in pastry and then broiled again. A piece of advice, if, if you're trying to roast a hedgehog and it refuses to unroll, simply take the dead body and put it in hot water. Or at least that's what the recipe books say. It's gross now, it was gross then, but hell do we love it, it's fast food. Stopping for a few minutes to pick up a meat pie for lunch was as common as hitting the drive through today and just as likely to give you diarrhea. Just back then, diarrhea would probably kill you. Fast food cooks were notorious for using diseased or undercooked meat or just warming up yesterday's spoiled leftovers. Again, not very different from what goes on at the back of Taco Hell or Taco Bell. Fast foods of London of the late 13th and early 14th century contained easy portable foods much like today's Big Mac. Meat pies, hotcakes, tansies, and wafers. These meat pies called umble pies consisted of edible entrails from deer or wild animals, generally just scrap meat. These cook shops functioned like medieval drive throughs where customers walked up and put an order at the window. The food was being mass prepared, then individually produced. They toss your little pie in the flames right there, pull her out a second later, and there you go, enjoy your entrails and wheat. In many 
tiny urban areas, one street became known as the fast food capital for the city. In Bristol, Cook's Row catered to the customers looking for fast, tasty food. As a result of these innovative fast food kitchens, professional cook emerged during the medieval period, employed at the great estates and in smaller shops of urban centers. At number five, married young. Lots of people get married at different ages. I mean, I know people I went to high school with who are already married, and I know people who didn't get married until later in life. But in medieval times, women, or rather girls, were getting married off at very young ages. At just 12 years old, a girl would reach the age of maturity and was then entitled to marry, usually to someone her parents had already chosen for her. To me, that just sounds so unfair, right? I mean, this kid hasn't really been able to live their life, make mistakes and learn from them, and now they're expected to be a wife and soon a mother? I could never. I mean, I'm only 22, so I'm not even thinking about those prospects, but I couldn't even imagine the amount of pressure that would be on a 12 year old at the time. What's worse than just the age at which these girls got married was the treatment that they received from their husbands. Under civil law, a husband was literally allowed to physically harm his wife. In moderation, of course. It was actually a medieval tradition for husbands to quote, treat his wife as a pupil and teach her manners. As you could imagine, this made a lot of wives really mad, and so many wives offed their husbands. But things rarely got better after that because if they were caught, they would be sentenced to burn at the stake. Note to self, don't get married in medieval times. Number four, the walk of shame. We've all heard the term walk of shame at some point, but what does it really mean? And also, where did it originally come from? Well, it was originally referred to as a skimmington or rough music. And no, it doesn't mean they would blast Slipknot this whole time. This was done to wives who were bossy or overbearing. They would be forced to walk through the entire town barefoot, all those crooked, horrible stone roads, ankles just toast, it was horrible. They would also be scandally clad too because why not? Because men are making the rules, that's why. And as you guessed it, crowds would be waiting outside, all prepared to bang pans and yell horrible things at her. I guess these dudes just never had jobs. I don't know, they were just always on standby, ready to yell at a lady walking by through town, bare feet, all because she was deemed too bossy. Okay. If you're wondering who exactly is responsible for these public humiliations, um, the court. The official court. Judge Judy back in the day would be like, yes or no, did you raise your voice? Okay, case dismissed. Take your shoes off, we're done here. What a joke. At number three, ladies of the night. Sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do to get that coin, right? We all have our side hustles and dead end jobs to be able to afford rent and whatnot. And sometimes we're not exactly proud of the work that we do to make money. It was the same back in medieval times. People had to find any means to make money and for a lot of women, they used what their mama gave them to support themselves and their families. One of the more positive sides of life for women in medieval times was the fact that being a woman of the night was actually a recognized profession. Later on throughout the times, this profession would be deemed illegal, but in medieval times, it was as common as being a baker or something. These women were actually considered to be merchants because they sold their bodies as if it was any other sellable good. Being a woman of the night was such a common and widespread profession that nearly every town in medieval times had a brothel, even in towns with small populations. So yeah, maybe they didn't have that big of a marketplace, but they no doubt had a place where you could go Go see some quality mommy milkers. Number two, grand theft witchcraft. If you were a woman in the Middle Ages, you were accused of being a witch pretty often. They thought women communicated with the devil, like Brie mentioned earlier, just because some townsfolk with three teeth said so. Great, thanks, Abe. Good job, good report. The punishment for practicing witchcraft wasn't a heavy fine, like guys who cheated, but they would be burnt at the stake. This was popular in Scotland along with drowning. Those are the two big ones. Remember earlier how I said women would sometimes be dipped into a river or a pond? Well, they would also sometimes just be left there. It's called witch dipping, and depending on if she floated or sank, that's, you know, Witch or not, the dumbest thing I ever heard. If you were charged with treason or witchcraft, that was the ideal punishment, because it surely beats burning to death in front of an entire village. This all got out of control come the start of the 17th century with the Salem witch trials. That's when people were like, you know what, I think this is wrong. I think we should stop, let's put this torch out. I think we're good. That's when 19 people were executed for being witches. God forbid you knew how to do bed mass in the Middle Ages. Also, that's a lot of coordination to get that many townsfolk together and be like, okay, you need this, you need this, how many people are standing here? Almost like you would use basic math to figure that out. 
You're a witch too. Spoiler alert, we're all witches, because we know things. I don't know, I hate this. And finally at number one, Crimes of the Heart. For some unknown reason, people were really out here in these streets in medieval times trying to accuse women of everything. Witchcraft was a common accusation, but the other common crime that women were often accused of was adultery. But you see, the thing is, Someone could accuse a woman of adultery even if she never had physical contact with another person. Now, how the heck does that work, you ask? Well, it depended on where these people lived. During the medieval age in the Byzantine Empire, it was considered adultery if they spent a night outside of their husbands or parents' homes. In Slavic parts of Europe, a woman could be considered guilty of infidelity for simply going to a public event. I'm pretty sure with this logic, if you even breathe in the same general vicinity of a man, then you could be accused of adultery. I mean, what the F is that up? The only bright side, I guess, is the fact that when it came down to punishments for adultery, men usually got the worst punishments in comparison to women, however, they would be accused of this crime way less often than women, so I guess in a way we still got the short end of the stick. Damn it. I do want to start off with something that may be somewhat of a familiar career. So we're going to start with chariot riders. It goes without saying that people don't really remember that there's places outside of Europe when it comes to the medieval ages, and they never come up in conversation. The Byzantine Empire had existed since 395, and it ended when the medieval era did in 1453. And one high-paced, action-packed, yet wildly dangerous job that was flexing the great wealth and progress of the empire was chariot racing which differed from modern horse racing or even NASCAR racing. You were exposed, the chariots had no backs, and you were standing without any seat belts or restraints to keep you from flying off. You could be smashed against the stone pillars, dragged to your death behind your own horses. The appeal of racing for the fans appeared to be the same as the modern fans. Testosterone, adrenaline, bloodshed, and gambling. Racers, meanwhile, had the potential for a fortune and their freedom. Because that's what made the job suck, its chariot riders weren't free men. And knowing you could win 15 bags of gold, uh, yeah, you're gonna kill any other racer who tries to get in your way. Because if you lose, you're just going back to hard labor. There were four teams in the Byzantine chariot racing. The whites, the greens, the blues, and the reds. Eventually these teams merged and it just became the greens and the blues. And the fans were so passionate about the sport that, that when they weren't throwing nail studded tablets under the track to sabotage opponents, they were breaking into bloody brawls to support their own team. And now, on the complete flip side, in primitive medieval Europe, a job called Flatulist. As someone who reads and writes about history all day, every day, I really do have a hard time with how the Europeans got so high and mighty and dubbed everyone else primitive when they literally lived like it was the New Jersey's public landfill and had the humor to match. So yeah, believe it or not, royals would actually employ an individual called a flatulist to entertain crowds sigh by farting. These individuals would pass gas in what they called amusing manners, such as to music or even on certain cues to get big laughs. Irish gas performers were called brage tours instead of flatulists. St. Augustine, of all people, once wrote about flatulists, saying that they possess such a command of their bowels and can break wind continuously at will so as to produce the effect of singing. As if it couldn't get more weirdly infuriating, some flatulists were actually considered celebrities of their time. One was Roland the Farter, who performed for Henry II's court annually. After several years, Henry rewarded him with 30 acres of land, a giant manor for his skilled entertainment. Let's hear about how these old ladies would just you're healed. In ancient and medieval Europe, a group of wise women who were mostly elderly would give insight into medical issues primarily concerning the female body that the male counterparts had yet to grasp. And some of these homeopathic healers would actually spit on young ladies three times in order to protect them from the evil eye. Talk about a weird job, huh? This custom of spitting opens up a wide subject. Not only is it practiced in the hope of obtaining good fortune for the spit e, but amongst all ages and almost all people had been considered as an act to safeguard the spitter as well. According to Theocritius, amongst the ancient Greeks and Romans, the most common remedy against an invidious look was spitting. It was hence called despir malam. It is necessary to spit three times into the breast of the person who fears fascination. Invidious look and fascination is in reference to the evil eye. Old women were accustomed to avert the evil eye from children by spitting onto their own bosoms. And among the ancient Greeks where this tradition even came from, it was custom 
customary to do the triple spit into your own bosom at the sight of someone with a condition or ailment you wish not to be stricken with. Leprosy, maybe they're a madman, maybe they're struggling with epilepsy. This act was done in defiance of the omen and spitting is known to be a sign of inversion, bidding it not come into their life as it had to the individual stricken with it. These spitting grannies were some of the first women hunted because they were believed to be evil sorceresses and witches. Because if farting was an entertainment, animal eviscerations were? Meet the bear leaders, an unusual historical profession involving exactly what the name describes, literally leading bears from village to village. Bears were mostly used for blood sports like bear baiting in which packs of dogs were set to fight against the bear. You can imagine how that go. Both Henry IV and Elizabeth I were famously fans of that horrific bloodshed and, by the Tudor era, increasing numbers of bear pits or bear gardens were constructed in major cities. Bear leaders allowed villagers to enjoy entertainment of the big city bear baiting fights in the comfort of their own homes. Incidentally, by the 18th century, the term bear leader actually came to refer to a different profession altogether. They were literally tutor and babysitter hybrids who were hired by parents to keep boisterous young noble sons under control and out of trouble, particularly during the Grand Tour. What's that mean? Taking care of crappy noble child was the same as handling bears. So let me think, leading bears from city to city making money in the medieval era, or or raising a spoiled entitled child in an era where there's no water, washing the snot off their face or the stickiness off their fingers. Bear, bear, I'll take the bear. Can I get some bears over here? Bear, yeah. Here's one that's still a job to this day, adult adoptee. Japan's birth rate is probably worse than that of a nunnery, but they do have the second largest adoption rate, 90% of which is in between two adult Japanese men. This is often because the older man's employee or their pre-existing son-in-law, who could then agree per contract to take the name of his now sister wife, but they can be flexible negotiators in a sun surge. For example, if the younger man still has his starter pack parents, the older man will happily offer those parents a buyout. If their new handpicked son is already married, they'll also just adopt his wife as part of the package deal. Like most hardcore Japanese business practices, this weird form of feudal meritocracy can be traced back to the age of medieval samurai. For centuries, Japanese nobles would seek out competent young men to audition for who wants to be the next clan heir. And nowadays, major companies like Mitsubishi, Toyota, and Canon have actually been handed over to former CEO's adopted children. The practice of using adoption to pick the next pater familias was also popular with the ancient Roman nobility. An example being the first proper emperor, Augustus aka Octavian. He was only a distant relative of Julius Caesar until he was adopted in the dead dictator's will to continue the hostile takeover of Rome. But the European practice of adult adoption exists and then was wiped out by the new feudal nobility during the medieval ages. Not because they wanted to create a more competitive market for baby orphans, after all, how would the church get its free labor if not by people dropping them off on their steps? On the contrary, these Christian rulers banned adoption altogether, believing nobody deserves to be part of a good family unless they slid into that privilege on a wave of nepotism and discarded placenta. On a lighter note, pigs in your blanket. No, not in a, uh, in yours. Because when you live in a mud and straw hut that is 100% full of humidity and would absorb every smell ever brought into it, including that of the family beer bucket, what you wanna do is add an animal pen to that and a loosely made roaring fire in the middle of the room. There were a number of home designs revolving around a single room first floor with a fence or other partial barrier dividing it. Animals were kept on one side of the barrier, humans lived on the other. This kept the animals body heat inside the house, marginally adding to the indoor temperatures during the cold season and providing literal hell during the summer ones. But I mean, hey, you could always let them wander loosely outside. But weren't medieval houses like super tiny? <laughs> Correct, but so were the medieval farm animals. Homies were undernourished and so small that a full grown bull was around the size of a modern calf and sheep were only a third of the size that they are now today. Modern sheep yield around 7.3 pounds of wool. Medieval fleece yield was something less than one pound per animal. And speaking of, let's segue into how all your food was dry. We sure, we can't truly know if medieval food was bad because nowadays we're spoiled. We have spice and garlic and proper cooking abilities. They 
had some meat, some grains, some vegetables, and a figure the F out mentality. As a result, we're gonna be more grossed out or picky with their food, but if we experienced it from their perspective without having tasted the food we've tasted now, it probably wouldn't be half bad. But hell would it be dry. Just so dry. That's the one thing I don't think any of us could survive, even with perspective. In the medieval period, meats and breads were kept well stored by drying them. Meat specifically was salted, then dried. Bread at the time wasn't made with yeast, so it tended to be flatter and it didn't mold, it would just go harder with time. Let's do some comparison. Here's the meat of the medieval period compared with some modern day beef jerky, the closest thing. Even our dried meat of the 21st century is juicier than the medieval version and probably wouldn't be the usual jaw workout. Now for bread, here's some medieval bread and here's some modern day bread of similar composition. See how medieval bread is a lot more enclosed and sturdier than modern bread? Looks like if you needed a spare tire, you could drill a hole in this bad boy, toss her on the frame. Medieval food was meant to last. And sometimes making things like these breads and meats were the family business. You may have seen the recent 10 reasons why living in ancient Egypt was impossible video, in which case you'd know that it was a custom of the times and place for a father to determine the career of his son. This ideology was shared in a few other places, ancient China, Greece, and medieval England apparently, where the trades were usually passed from generation to generation. Commoners in the Middle Ages worked where they lived, consequently it made it easier for their trade to be passed down from father through son through exposure from a young age. It also meant that the father of the household suddenly died or was called to battle. A son, no matter his age, could immediately pick up on his father's role and provide for the household and thus it remained the family business. If your dad was a cobbler, he would most likely be a cobbler. Unlike the Egyptians whose sons would branch out and try new trades as they got older and sometimes establish their family in another commerce, the medieval English really stayed stuck in their ways to the point that when they finally did adopt last names, they were usually that of their profession, which is why you'll see a lot of brewers, smiths, archer, fisher, potters, and so forth. But before 1066, you survived off of only one name, which doesn't seem that bad, but it definitely was. Let's explain why. Problem one, if you're in a room with like three Williams, you can't just yell a last name to find the specific William you need. Problem two, let's say one of these Williams kills someone in the room and the dying man says William killed him, but there's no way for him to tell you which one it was. Now all the Williams in town get rounded up. Problem three, there's no cameras, and the eyewitnesses can verify three of the Williams in town as being in the room, but nobody can determine which one killed the man since they're all 5'4 white dudes with brown hair. How do we resolve this problem? Depends on the village, the clergy, and how much those Williams were each liked in town if anybody had a bias towards them. They may determine the right one, they may decide to hang all of them because they don't know who did it. When surnames were introduced, they'd often include a nickname, such as Richard Red if your hair was red. If Richard went bald over time, he could change it to Richard Bald. And now our last reason you couldn't survive is just by being Cornish. If you were Cornish, you weren't regarded as English. When the Truro received its crown charter in 1173, it addressed it to the barons of Cornwall and all men, both Cornish and English. Let's break into why that is in a little known history lesson. Cornish is straightforward, Celtic people native to the island of Britain. English is more complicated, derived from a Scottish pronunciation of the word Angles. The Scots, and eventually all of the Celts, had adopted this word to refer to the Angles and the Saxons who'd been invading their lands and who would soon form together to declare themselves the kings, forcing control over the Cornish people. The Cornish were made to do hard labor in mines, their language made illegal, and they were taxed to death to fund the other English colonial wars and pursuits, originally with the other Celts and then in the Americas, Africa, and India. Funding these colonial wars meant that the English stripped the land, so they clear cut every tree and ran every mine dry, killing millions of Cornish people in the process. The Cornish rose up against the English tyrants many times and on several occasions would have overthrown London itself if it had not been for terrible betrayals from supposed allies. Eventually, there was not enough wealth in Cornwall to sustain the Cornish. Millennia of Roman wars and occupation followed by English wars and occupation had destroyed the land and broken the people. This is what drove the Cornish dysphoria and it's why there's now 10 times as many English in Cornwall than there are actual Cornish people. Elders there still suffer the effects of intergenerational trauma and PTSD. SD. Number 10, trial by jury. The concept of trial by jury can be traced back to ancient Greece and Rome. Don't get me wrong, that's old school. But the first recorded use of a modern jury system, that dates back to the 12th century England. Medieval England, yes, let's get some men in a room and point at witches. Henry II introduced the practice to replace previous methods of trial, which at that point was relying on physical combat or divine intervention, all that kind of 
like that. Under this new system, a group of 12 men from the community would be chosen to hear evidence and determine the guilt or innocence of said accused. Right, a little better, a little, you know, less witchcraft, more, okay, we're all talking now, we're conversing. This system gradually spread throughout Europe and then beyond, so on, and Danforth, and it became an important cornerstone of many modern legal systems. Back in the day, this was a noble deed, it was an honor to be part of the jury, you know? Today, not, not really so much, not the same at all. You're like, what? No, I don't wanna do that. It's gonna take so long. It's gonna be like four weeks of jury duty. I haven't done it yet. I've just jinxed myself. I'm gonna get called any day now. Don't answer, you know what I mean? Just don't answer your mail, don't look, just avoid it. That's what I do. Number nine, the stocks. All right, relax, stock bros. I'm not talking about those stocks. I'm talking medieval stocks. Those ones are a bit different. Those ones were very bad. Those are all bad. The stocks were a common form of punishment in medieval times. The convicted person's ankles were locked into these wooden boards with holes for their feet and stuff, and their hands were sometimes also restrained. We've seen this before. Usually people are like this. You go to a theme park, you pose with your family in one of these things, you're like, hey, I'm stuck. You're like, get me out, this is scary. They would be left in public spaces like that, such as the marketplace or town square, anywhere public because, why of course, you know, shame, shame, we gotta shame everyone back then. And if that wasn't bad enough, the accused would then be pelted with food or even physically attacked by the crowd. Imagine that, imagine being so sparse for food and you're like, yeah, let's throw our bread at that guy. It's like, what, what a waste, we need that. The duration of the punishment is varied, but it could range from a few hours to several days. Yeah, locked up like this for days at a time. What a joke. It was used for various crimes, theft, drunkenness, and slander. And it was intended to humiliate and shame the offender while also serving as a deterrent to others. Guys like, oh, I'd hate to be that guy over there. Yeah, for sure. All right, let's throw food at him now. Sick. So dumb. So dumb. Number eight, the drunkard's cloak. Yeah, this one's uh, quite funny. Not really, but we'll see. The drunkard's cloak, also known as the barrel or the shaming cloak. Again, shame, shame, big important step back there. This is a humiliating punishment used in medieval times for people who were drunk or disorderly in public. This person, this drunk person, they were forced to wear a large barrel or a cloak made of wood or heavy cloth, something big and obvious with holes cut out for their heads and arms. Like they're a big mascot, a big barrel mascot in medieval times. And sometimes they would have offensive messages or images painted on it. You know what I mean? Like the piece of paper that says, kick me. That was like the old school version of that, much worse. The person would then be paraded through town in this garment, this outfit, this big barrel and not fun, often with crowds throwing garbage or food at them. You know, that kind of medieval Game of Thrones stuff. This punishment was intended to publicly shame the person as well, so yeah. Shame and then we'll go into the rough nitty gritty stuff at the end here. Number seven, eavesdropping. Eavesdropping back in the day. I mean, today we've all done it, right? We've all listened at some point in our lives to somebody we don't know. Every time I hear somebody in our hallway, in our apartment, I have to look, right? I'm like, who is it? Someone breaking in? But if you did it during the dark ages, if you listened in on a conversation you weren't supposed to hear, well, there were some serious consequences that were waiting for you. Eavesdropping was considered a serious crime back then. That's why they're always whispering in Game of Thrones. Now it makes sense, right? The act of secretly listening in on someone's conversation without their knowledge and or consent while this crime was viewed as a breach of privacy and trust. <sighs> How dare thee? It was often associated with other crimes such as treason or espionage. This was a big bat. Espionage? Are you kidding? Just because you heard someone say something? Get out of here. Punishments here could include fines, public humiliation, classic, imprisonment, or yeah, remember what happened to Littlefinger in Game of Thrones? Not great. There's worse stuff that could be done. Yikes. Horrible. Number six, Pacific hunting. Yeah, you gotta be sure which, uh, where you throw an arrow back then. In medieval England, the hunting of the king's deer was considered a very serious crime. Yeah, not that deer. That one's fine, but just don't you hit that one. Mm -mm. The act of killing or even injuring a deer was punished harshly under the royal forest law, which was enforced by the king's foresters. That'd be a cool job, just rolling through the forest looking for people. The law applied only to the king's forests, which were areas of land set aside specifically for hunting for his food. Violators could be subjected to a variety of punishments, including fines, imprisonments, and even mutilation. Yeah, a little different than public humiliation. It's just mutilation this time. This law was meant to preserve the deer population for the king's personal use and enjoyment and served as a way for the monarchy to maintain control over the forest and the resources that it provided. So if you want food, go to that 
the forest over there. It's not even a forest, it's like a marsh. It's horrible. It's like three frogs left. Good luck. Number five, witchcraft. All the way back in 1542, the UK Parliament passed the Witchcraft Act, which condemned anyone who practiced the art to death. It was repealed five years later, then reinstated with flair in 1562, meaning they added more oomph to it. This led to many women being sentenced to gruesome interrogations, trials, and death punishments such as burning at the stake. How does one know that someone was a witch? Well, point one, they look like one to you. Two, if you threw a hog-tied woman into a pond and she floated, she was a witch. Number three, you're a woman and financially independent. Number four, you're old. Honestly, the list goes on. Anyone could be accused of being a witch. If someone wanted an easy way to get rid of you, they could just whisper in someone's ear that you bewitched them when they were dreaming. Number four, failure to entertain. Today, if a comedian doesn't make us laugh or we don't enjoy a TV show, we just change the channel. But back in medieval times, failure to entertain the king or queen could result in your death. Nicholas Ferial was one of the most famous jesters in history, for instance, known as Tribule. He entertained King Louis XII and Francis I in France during the 1400s. He was born with a smaller head and brain than other children, which affected his neurological and physical appearance. The king seemed to be amused by this, and so he served as his jester. He wasn't academically smart, but boy was he witty. But sometimes is what took him too far. This got him eventually into trouble, and Francis I decided to have him executed. Why he didn't just fire him and kick him out in the first place, no idea. He must have said something that really towed the line. But everything was extreme back then, keep in mind. But the king asked him, how would he like to die? And Tribulet cleverly replied, old age. This broke the king's foul mood because damn, it was a good joke, and had him exiled from the realm instead. But damn, he got it close. Number three, no more mince pies. This one should make some of our British fans gasp or run for a builder's tea and a mince meat pie to clutch it close to their heart. But rest assured, it was only on one Christmas day that eating mince pies was illegal, and that was on December 25th, 1644. On that year, it was legally mandated because the celebration fell on a legally mandated day of fasting. However, the pies themselves were seen as a symbol of the moral excess of Christmas season. Further legislation was proposed in 1656 to clamp down on an immoral and lush Christmas traditions like and including the mincemeat pie. England was currently under the rule of Oliver Cromwell who was just the worst and he was very religious and just wanted everyone to behave and it was part of his effort to tackle gluttony. But when Charles became king people stopped going after holiday treats and mince pies were safe. Once again. Number two, a beached whale. So, considering poaching was illegal in the king's forest, it only makes sense that they would try to make it the same for the sea. Back then, they really ate everything they could get their hands on, from lamprey to goose to porpoise, and now whale. Whales were seen as a royal fish, and if one washed up on shore, they automatically became the property of the royals in charge. The law was passed by Edward II in 1324 because he just loved whales. He decreed that all whales, sturgeons, dolphins, and porpoises caught within 5k of shore were considered royal fish. Their meat and oil fetched a lot of money at the markets and the rich liked to covet it for their own so it was for selfish reasons that he made this rule. But funny enough, the law has never been repealed and you need to ask Queen Liz for permission to sell it, though I doubt she'd say no. Number one, animal trials. So it turns out that not only were humans punished if they did something illegal, it was also animals as well. In medieval times apparently it was a regular thing to put animals on the stand. Everything from hogs, beetles, rats, mice, cockerels, you name it. Absolute Craziness. In the 14th century, local people even prosecuted Spanish flies. Flies! They have no control. They don't even know what they're doing. Spanish flies were dangerous to livestock and would ruin vegetation. Needless to say, they weren't well liked. So they were appointed a lawyer and given great dignity in court, though the verdict was obviously not favorable because they couldn't speak for themselves. They were condemned and banished from a plot of land. It was believed that animals who committed a crime were possessed by the devil, and to let them go unpunished would give the devil permission to take over human affairs. So they would like literally hang pigs by nooses to punish them. Did the flies actually ever come back? Uh, probably, but at least the humans felt better about it. Number 10, duels. The Dark Ages, yeah, a lot of fun. Hope you're prepared at all times to defend your home, your family, and your honor. Good luck, you get a really sh 
sword as well, break a leg or two. Medieval duels were a common spectacle among men. It was a means to settle disputes and display bravery and stand like this and talk like this, of course. Dressed to the nines in armor and tights, knights clashed on horseback and on foot, wielding swords, maces, and shields. I wouldn't be able to carry any of those. My arms would be shaking just trying to hold a shield. They're so heavy. They're so impossibly heavy. These intense one-on-one -on -one bouts were governed by strict rules, often overseen by heralds or nobles. Ah, uh, yes, our noble Joe Rogan will oversee this bout. Now bump fists. Ping. Duels showcased a knight's honor with victory bringing respect to the land. Yeah, you gotta bring that respect back to your land or else you're not coming back to that land. The outcomes impacted social standing and reputation. While duels had its risks, it was an integral part of medieval culture. So go support your medieval times, dudes. Go eat some chicken and watch an $80 show. They're pretty fun. I haven't been yet. Number nine, falconry. This one's pretty bad. So when you think of the dark ages and the jobs that were available, we often forget about this one. This one's pretty cool. Falconry was a popular pastime among noblemen during the medieval period and involved the training and hunting with birds of prey, such as falcons, but also hawks. But hawkonry doesn't sound as cool, so we gotta say falconry. Rolls off the tongue. Rolls off thy tongue. These noble hunters formed a deep bond with their feathered companions through meticulous training. Now falcons, prized for their speed agility, and keen eyesight, these were used to pursue and capture smaller game. Falconry served as both a prestigious sport, but also a practical method of acquiring food because, well, Uber didn't exist back then. But you know what we had? A guy with a falcon that we can trust. A scary man with a falcon who'd walk around and, and grill you all day. Number eight. Tights. I don't know why I said it so angry. I'm like, tights. In medieval times, men wearing tights was a fashion trend that reflected social status and style. I got a pair of tights for running, and I'll be honest, I've never felt more like a knight in my entire life. Pull them up tight as a knight. Let's do this. Tights were originally worn for practical purposes, like keeping warm and having an ease of movement, of course. But tights gradually became a symbol of high fashion among the upper classes. Of course. Can we do that with sweatpants now? Can we? I feel like we're close. They accentuated the physique and showcased a man's wealth and refined taste, you can say. Sure, we'll get onto that in a little bit. Yeah, all of that in one pair of tights. How lucky were we? Tights were often brightly colored, sometimes even covered in fun patterns. They're your tights. You're living in them. Get creative. Why not? This fashion statement eventually influenced modern day styles. So next time you see a jogger, just think of the noble knight right there running to his next bout with his water belt. Number seven, cod pieces. Since we're talking about tights, let's talk about what we stuffed inside said pants said pantaloons. In medieval history, cod pieces were a peculiar fashioned accessory, trend, whatever. They were worn by men. Now these padded or stuffed coverings were designed to protect, but also emphasize the groin area. And it got really stupid. They really got carried away with it. It became a joke almost immediately. Originally serving a practical purpose, cod pieces eventually became exaggerated and decorative, symbolizing masculinity. Again, all while wearing tights, which is so funny. What a sight to see. Some guy wearing like the biggest cup you've ever seen. You're like, this isn't cool. You don't look like a really cool guy right now. Why is there so bumpy? You should go see the local barber and get that checked out. Uh, their size and prominence varied over time with some, of course, reaching comical proportions, covering them in diamonds, studs. Like, you know, it doesn't look, that doesn't look good, man. Hashtag not hot. Get out of here. Number six, public bathing. Bathing establishments, such as a bathing house or a communal tub, these provided a place for men to gather and cleanse themselves. It was so disgusting. Now you think guys are gross now in the washroom and whatever goes on in there. Back then these gatherings were considered a social gathering where men would interact, relax, and discuss various matters. Official means, okay? Watching a guy wash his behind while he's pitching you a beard tax. You're like, okay, sure, perfect place for a meeting. Let's do it. Mind if I cover up first? Weirdo. The act of bathing back then was seen as both a physical and a spiritual purification. Ah, yes, so spiritual. All this is really transcending me. I love it. Let's go home and plan some stuff. While nudity was not unusual back in these settings, modesty was still valued just a smidgen. So individuals would often use towels or cloths for some level of privacy during these meetings. Thank God. How vulnerable is that? Like, hey, any ideas? You're like, yeah, man, I'm naked. Why don't we get dressed first? Here's my idea. Number five. Keel hauling. Not to be confused with Kegels, keel hauling was reserved for the worst of the worst at sea. This was used by pirates for sailors who disobeyed orders and all that jazz. The victim would be suspended by a rope with rocks or weights around their ankles. Then they're lowered to the keel of the ship where all the sharp barnacles live. After so long, these ships are so old, it's just piled on layers and layers of barnacles. Then they would get dragged all along them with the water and 
everything. Water plus pain, it's a lot, it's a deadly combination. Anything to do with barnacles in the sea, no chance. I'll literally tell you anything, Blackbeard. Anything. Number four, solitary confinement. This is a kind of punishment that still exists in our modern society, but it can truly be one of the worst punishments out there because of the type of psychological distress that it causes. We were all just in a pandemic for so long. We got so bored and we had Netflix and iPads and I whatevers. I can't even imagine this back in the day. Basically, it's a prisoner living in a single cell with little to no contact with anybody else. Not even like a guard or anything rattling keys like in the old times. It was just nothing. No one would even check on them. There are many stories about people being locked up for so long they forget about their families. And some people have gone away to solitary confinement for so long that once they're out, they just forget how to speak, really. They forget how to be a human and interact in the real world. Solitary confinement and the negative effects that it has on a person is becoming a wider topic of conversation because of the effects on a person's mental well-being, and it's a topic for a lot of human rights organizations. Back in medieval times, solitary confinement was literally just a room made of stones. It was pitch black, freezing cold, you were tucked away below some janky castle, and most of the time, you weren't really alone. In the dark, nibbling away your little piggies were number three rats another game of thrones classic if you're a rat person i know there's a lot of people who do tricks with their pet rat that's cool but maybe cover stuart little's eyes for this one rats as a medieval punishment where do i even start okay this one was a punishment for the rats at the same time what was once called a rat trap involved a man or woman being tied down to something and then a metal enclosure would be strapped down to their chest or their stomach now inside this metal enclosure there's rats which are also just loose walking around and the person can feel them the little feet walking around in their skin and this is when the person and still in the punishment begins heating the other end of the metal enclosure historically it was hot coals that were usually placed on top or there's a fire underneath which quickly creates a hot environment for the rats inside from there, the rats begin frantically searching for a way out, but because it's made of metal and they can't bite through that, they find your skin, and then that, they can obviously bite through. So, you can paint the picture in your head, it's disgusting. Number two, the breaking wheel. The breaking wheel is literally just a large disc, a pirate ship wheel almost, just lying there, where somebody is then tied to it, and everybody else just hammers them and beats the out of them over and over. But of course, since we're talking about medieval times, everything has to be a show and whatnot. So once the accused was beaten and then presumed dead, the wheel would lift up and turn just to show everybody what's up. Another way to use the breaking wheel, yep, there was more than one, again, creative folks back then, they would tie a person to the wheel and then continue to rotate it and then all the ropes below would get tighter and tighter and twist. Kind of like the rack, but with a literal twist. And finally coming in at number one, the brazen bull. This one takes the rat's problem and then makes it a you problem. Out of all the ones on this list, the brazen bull is the last one that I would do straight up haunting. It's also been referred to as a Sicilian bull and basically it's not too complex. There is a bronze sculpture often in the shape of, you guessed it, a bull. But in medieval times, it was just a big closed cauldron and usually it was large enough to fit a person inside. Yeah, this was in a Saw movie too, I believe. That's how you know it's a good one when it's in the movie Saw. So once the person was locked inside or it was leaned over so they couldn't get out, a fire would then be set underneath this bull and then you can probably figure out the rest in your head. They would even engineer the bull so that when somebody screamed, it sounded like a bull's roar. How fun is that? How fun is history? I'm learning so much about history that's fun on Bumblebee. All right, so you guys know my drill, so let's start off with the information most people may know a little bit more about already, such as dowries, which is a nice way for fathers to say, I will literally pay your family to get this chick out of my house. The arrangement of marriage was done by the bride and groom's parents. Royal or noblemen were sometimes able to choose their bride, but marriage back then was not based on love for the nobility. They were political arrangements. Husbands and wives were generally strangers until they first met, and if love was ever involved, it came after the couple had been married. But even if it didn't, most just sort of settled into a form of friendship or companionship or just living with each other. The arrangement of marriage was based on monetary worth. Noble girls equal fatter stacks. Meanwhile, peasant dowries didn't really happen often, and when they did, they were paid in utilitarian means. The family of a girl who was to be married would give a dowry to the family of the boy she was to marry. After the marriage was arranged, the wedding notice was posted up on the doors of the church and the notice was put up to ensure that there were no grounds for prohibiting the marriage by stating who was to be married and if anyone knew any reasons why they could not. But more on that in a little bit. Now. 
As mentioned, peasants were able to marry for love, but why make that choice? There was no marital benefits back then, because it's marriage or burn and damnation. Throughout the Middle Ages, the church essentially presented women with two life options in order to escape the sin of Eve. You could become celibate, which ultimately was the preferred choice, or to become married and mothers. Um, you don't bathe, there's feces everywhere, there's the plague, and a man could just kill you tomorrow for rejecting him, and you want to add kids to that equation? When there's no medicine either? Pass. Hard, hard pass. Nunneries were literal havens for these single women, because sure, you could be celibate and still live in town being a spinner or whatever, but again, you run the risk of some dude just jumping you and the courts blaming you for it and then doing something whack like cutting your nose off for it. Nunneries were female only, they kept things clean and locked up, so women could just try and have an ounce of peace in an era where existence was just to breed or feel bad about yourself. According to Halston CS, once a girl was physically ready to consummate, aka she met Aunt Flo, she was ready for marriage. However, since puberty came earlier for females than males, they could marry at a younger age. So, for peasants who were genuinely interested in marriage out of love, something that could only be done consensually on both sides, they were eligible once they'd hit their respective puberties. And were able to wed. No parental consent required, which is the next on the list. As people lived short lives in the middle age period, parents of nobility often made arrangements early on and a few months old baby could be betrothed to another few month old baby, and then raised in their respective royal nurseries until they hit that jolly old consummation age in their teens. Think Sleeping Beauty being promised to the prince in the Disney movie. Peasants and commoners, however, were able to marry as they wished, and parental consent wasn't even required. It was like this for centuries. But there's always those folks who didn't like when two separate religions mixed, and there's always those who tried to take advantage of the easy I do policy. So good things never last. And it didn't. When this law finally changed in England in the 18th century, the old rules still applied in Scotland, making towns just over the border, such as Gretna Green, a destination for English couples defying their family and wanting to marry without their consent. A brief personal story for you guys. So my mother is a traveler and decided to visit the famous Gretna Green town and wedding site, where the tradition of Gretna Green marriages still lives today. My mother was taking photos and reading history plaques when she got taken aside by her tour guide. A couple whose family wasn't supportive of their relationship, just like the couples of the past, had shown up and decided to marry spontaneously in the traditional way. They had chosen Gretna Green for its historical significance to their unsupported love, and they needed two witnesses. The tour guide could act as one witness, but they needed a second. So my mother stood as a witness for a young couple who had just traveled to the border to marry at Gretna Green alone, experiencing the same pilgrimage thousands of couples had done in history. So on the topic of witnesses, how did that get started? Up next is witness schmittness. In the Middle Ages, the household was headed by a husband, and his wife was the center of the family life and economic productivity. As John Wellis said in 1486, more things are necessary for a household than four naked thighs. And he used this retort upon hearing that his alleged betrothed, Alice Billingham, had publicly declared they were married. Instead of saying it straight, John was chastising Alice for suggesting they could legitimize their romantic relationship without the necessary social status and financial stability, not just intercourse. Alice, however, goes, na 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 bro, I got the receipts, which were her witnesses to the fact that John had asked her to be his wife on the Feast of St. Valentine's that same year, which historically, yes, has always been a romance hallmark holiday, asking her for her hand so that she could be his Valentine forever. These two contrasting stories, however, give us a peephole into the tension between the expectation of love versus intercourse, and then the making of a good and economically fortuitous marriage in the Middle Ages. Alice says, you proposed to me with love, therefore that is our marriage basis. John says, I may have said I loved you, but I won't make a wife out of a... Well, you get it. So while God was the ultimate witness, that's why couples could just say stuff like be mine forever and become legally married, it's n nice and all, but it was highly recommended to have witnesses to avoid uncertainty like the Alice and John situation. Because they didn't just sign your wedding doc back then, they stopped your husband from wandering off. I've done a lot of talk on the ins and outs of marriage, but how about kiss to be kissed, the medieval wedding ceremony itself? So there was some errands to run leading up to the big day. First of all, 
long before the actual wedding, bands were called, which were literally three Sundays leading up, someone stands outside the church and hollers that your wedding day is coming up. It's done so that people can come find out about the celebration and come along to the wedding. But also, those who had objections had the opportunity to voice them. They also put up signs on the church door with information so if you're out just buying turnips one day and saw your husband's name and face on a poster, you could go up to the medieval lost and found and say, hey, yo, this one's mine. Wedding's off. A wedding ceremony could not be held on a Catholic holiday or on Sundays. A couple could not be married during a time of fasting. They can't be married by someone who had killed someone else. So make sure you got all those things written down to avoid. When weddings started to occur at churches, they were done at the front doors. Nobles married with big parades and elaborate garbs, while peasants sort of kicked it and whatever they had. The couple would exchange vows, usually some Jesus-y stuff, and the priests asked one last time if anybody's got any beef with these two getting hitched. After that, the groom presented his bride with a wedding ring, blessed by the priest, and the ring was placed on each finger of the bride before landing on the ring finger, and amen, the ring stays there. Then the procession goes into the church, a special mass began, and people prayed for the couple and their future offspring. After the mass, the priest kissed the groom on both cheeks, and finally, the groom would kiss the bride. At number five, always in danger. When knights weren't out in some kind of battlefield, they didn't just get to sit around doing nothing waiting for the next battle. They were still knights and people loved them, so they had to entertain people through tournaments. This wasn't your average tournament like when you went to a medieval times as a kid because this was way bloodier and safety was not really much of a priority. It wasn't as dangerous as going off to battle, but there was still a risk that knights had to take and sometimes it ended fatally. Tournaments would normally involve two different events, melee and jousting. We all know what jousting is though, right? It's where two knights on horseback charge at each other with lances trying to knock their opponent off their horse. This sport injured and even killed people in the past. In 1559, the King of France, Henry II, was killed during a jousting tournament because his opponent's lance broke apart and sent splinters into his eyes and brain. These tournaments were meant for fun and games and entertainment, but they often ended in bloodshed in some way, so these knights always had to risk their lives even when they weren't in an active fight. At number four, fired. As with any kind of job, medieval knights could get fired. These days, if you get fired, you just have to find another job to fall back on, but for knights, they had it much, much worse. Knights served their kings, and so if they did anything that went against their monarch, or if they did something that the king didn't like, they could essentially be fired from being a knight, since the king is the one who made them one in the first place. What the king giveth, he could taketh away, pretty much. When a knight was fired, the king would start by hacking off the knight's spurs, then they would break their sword, then they would burn the knight's coat of arms and hang their shield upside down for the entire kingdom to see because these people really liked public humiliation. And if you thought that was enough, just you wait because on top of the spurs and the sword and the shield, they would also execute the knight for good measure. So really, you never ever want to get fired back then because it would really end badly for you. At number three, burial. For medieval knights, dying was just part of the job. When someone became a knight, they knew that this was a risk that they were going to have to take. And for some knights, they worried about where they would be buried because it had to be in the right spot, otherwise they wouldn't go to heaven. When a knight died in battle, their body had to be buried in the right kind of dirt, and that was a consecrated dirt of a church graveyard. To solve this problem for young knights, when they were knighted, they would also be given a burial plot in a church graveyard so they knew that they were guaranteed a spot in heaven when they died. This, however, created a bit of a loophole for anyone wanting to get a one-way ticket to heaven because even older knights who enlisted later in life would be able to get buried beneath a stone effigy in a church and be able to go to heaven even if they really never did all that churchy stuff beforehand. At number two, yummy people. As you could probably imagine, for medieval knights, desperate times called for desperate measures. Oftentimes during battles, supplies would run out and knights would be left dealing with starvation on top of everything else that they were going through. This proved to be a huge problem during the Crusades because after supplies and food started to run out, people got desperate and started seeing other people as snacks if you know what I mean. Some of the poorest crusaders resorted to eating people to get them through their journey to take back the Holy Lands and as you can imagine, it was a pretty gory sight to see. Knights back then recalled seeing enemy forces on spits and dismembered people just laying around in plain view. It was rough being a knight back then and the amount of shortcuts and strategies people came up with just to survive got real dark real fast. 
And finally at number one, dehydration. On top of not having enough to eat, many knights from the crusades also didn't have anything to drink and many of them died of dehydration. Dehydration was especially deadly during heat waves. At one point things got so bad for knights embarking on their holy war that 500 knights died of dehydration in just one summer back in 1097. Since it was such a terrible way to go, people started weaponizing dehydration so to speak. This happened when the Sultan Saladin lured the enemy forces away from their water source and set fire to the grass around the enemy troops, causing them to overheat. Because they couldn't drink anything and because of the intense heat, the troops got too weak to fight back and then they were defeated by Saladin. The elements were so intense that these knights really had it bad. Weaponizing dehydration, that is a super messed up thing to do, but back then, people were ruthless. Number 10, pressure to perform. In the Middle Ages, either partner in a marriage was entitled to coitus with their partners under any circumstances. It was called the marriage right. This went both ways, and unless you were passionately in love with your partner and straight, this could be a nightmare. It was so sacred, you could even get it on in a church, and the priest would be like, yep, go for it. Failure to perform in the bedroom or anywhere was grounds for divorce, which was a huge deal at the time. Now the first problem here is a lack of consent, but the biggest problem for men who weren't inclined to sleep with their wives was impotency. There was no sympathy for men in these circumstances. If a wife accused her husband of this, then the couple would have to undergo a bedroom trial, where a crowd of wise elders, mainly grandmothers, aunts, and mothers, would watch the couple in their bedroom for three nights. If you were rich, this was even worse. These trials would be carried out in public in court. Yeah, that's right. The wife had to prove that the husband couldn't get it up in court. Now he could call on women of the night to prove his prowess, if he was so inclined, but if it was proven that he couldn't, then the couple would be divorced. But the bottom line, the main point of marriage was to have children, and if there weren't any, then this failure was placed heavily on the man. Number 9. Beastly Justice I figured I would put a lighthearted one on this list. This actually made me laugh while I was researching it. Beastly Justice was when animals had to go to court. They were also put on trial, like a full trial. It's wild to look back at a knight and the things they had to do for their kings and queens, but the fact that they also had to get up early and like attend these courts, royal courts, where a wild animal was taking the stand and it actually happened in history. This would happen after an animal runs through town. It would attack people, being confused and all, as most animals are, but the townsfolk would actually believe that the devil was involved in this animal's scheme. Like these animals worked for Big Red himself. In 1457, villagers in France had to deal with six pigs who ran wild and attacked locals. They did a lot of damage, so instead of just putting the animals down or setting them free, you know, away from your town, they took them to a real trial. There was a judge, a couple prosecutors, eight witnesses, a defense attorney for the pigs, which I gotta say, we should do a list just on that person alone. What a weird job. These pigs were hung from a gallows tree. A knight had to formally hang pigs after a trial was concluded. The 1400s were a wild time. Uh, Your Honor, due to my client being a pig, um... Number eight, a tanner. Even for a medieval peasant who never washed or clean themselves and literally lived in filth, this was a dirty job. Women were more commonly found in household chores or as milkmaids, barmaids, weavers, artisans, and tenant farmers. This job may have fallen mostly to men, and it was a rough one. I'll tell you. Men would rather go to war than do this job. You had to get skins from a butcher, along with the grime that covered it, which was mostly manure and blood. Then you had to trim the skins and get rid of all the hair. To do this, they had to let the hair follicles rot by sprinkling it with urine or soak it in a wood, ash, and lime solution. Can you tell which one was cheaper? Then they'd scrape off the hair and any skin before washing it again in pigeon droppings or dog poo to remove the lime and make it softer and more flexible. You. Or the craftsmen might use fermented barley or rye with stale beer or urine, again, as an additive. This could take up to three months. Three months plus longer as there was more rinsing and stretching until it could be used. Leather was a crucial resource, so though dirty, it was a really necessary job, but oh my god. No thank you. Number seven, being a knight. Being a knight, obviously it sounds cool. They have the sword, they have the horse, the flowing hair. They're saving the damsel in distress, all that jazz that you picture in your head. It actually sucked being a knight, a lot. First of all, chainmail. You know how heavy chainmail is alone? 
It's like 55 pounds, and that was underneath all of your armor. No way I could climb up on a horse wearing armor or chainmail. My knees would buckle. No, thank you. Being a knight is something that starts when you're seven years old as well. You would be given to a noble to learn for seven years, and then at age 14, you would become a squire. A knight's intern, not an ideal job to have when you're 14, but okay. But if you stick it out for just seven more years, then you become a knight. And then you can get your chest blown off jousting. Neat. All that time just to get rocked by another bigger dude on a bigger horse. No, just no for me. Number six, death by anything but mostly violence. Life in medieval times was considered basically brutal and short. If it wasn't the plague, it was a cold. If it wasn't disease, it was the weather. If it wasn't the weather, it was famine. If it wasn't famine, it was violence everywhere else. It was a damn miracle if you survived childhood. If you had to pick any other time in history to live, like you couldn't live in this one, Taylor asked me this earlier and I had a response, but it definitely wasn't this time. Literally block this time period from your mind. Between 1330 to 1479, men could expect to die nine years sooner than their female counterparts. The reason was violence against men by other men. But the biggest factor that made especially men's lives so short was the violence, as I mentioned. Think about it. It was men who were often called to war with only their farming tools, or if they were proper soldiers, they would have had more. But they were called off to do jobs that literally required them to kill or be killed. Homicide levels in medieval England were around 10 times higher than they are today. This isn't to say at all that women were excluded from this, they were mostly the victims of this violence, but there was a culture around men that expected them to take part in violence to the extreme. From drunken brawls to duels to playful sword fights gone wrong, torment, there was a lot going on. Male gangs were responsible for most of the mayhem as they were bolstered with the need to prove themselves. But also, if you were about to get mugged in an alleyway and somebody wanted to fight you, which was very likely because everyone was on edge, it was good to have backup. Losing your life can suck, but so can losing your gear because knights buy their own armor. The biggest barrier to entry for those who are peasants or serf turned knight was the absurdly high cost of equipment. Remember, this was centuries before governments decide to arm their troops for combat. You want to be blessed by the divine right to be controlled by me, the king, your whole life and have no freedom, property, life, money, individualism of your own only to die stupidly in a field somewhere, well you also need to buy your own armor. Being a knight was a fat rip off. Mostly you were paid in land ownership or sometimes just by the glory of your lord. And that's because the system benefited noblemen who grew up in it. Not much different from how things work nowadays. So any armor or weapons you needed had to be purchased on the side. With money you were never given. It's no problem for the knights of noble birth, but other knights would have to work the land and sell goods just to earn enough. Yes it is also a tin can and it's one size only. Only have fun rebuying pieces when weight fluctuates. One outlier though is new research and digital recreations show that knights were actually able to tumble, climb, chop wood, jump on horses, and run quite easily all in armor. So if you're scared of never being able to fit in again, never get out of it. Not like they washed much anyways. And while it can keep you safe, it can put a target on your back too. Held for ransom is next. And if you've ever watched a movie such as Gladiator, Braveheart, 300, Troy, to name a few, then you may recall that some dudes always wore special armor during battle, and some wore none. If you were rich enough or important enough, you could have the best of the best armor, made of the strongest but lightest materials to gain a defensive edge on the battlefield, all at the low, low price of your daddy's money. And it wasn't exclusive to any kingdom, so that means in one oh moment for everyone battling one another, knights realized that if they saw opponents in incredibly strong or elaborate armor, not to kill that guy, but keep him. Captured and Instead, a ransom could be demanded for a nobleman knight because only well off knights wore such good armor. So that's what you get for flashing your stack, I guess. Worst case, Ontario, if the ransom doesn't work out and none of your boys are a sizes 12 as 88s in tin seam, you can melt them down for some pieces of your own. Hey, what sucked more than the medieval knight? being married to one. Like so many of the sickest jobs in history, being a knight was exclusively reserved for the owners of a dingaling. Their wives were expected to sit at home, not learning to kill people with a broadsword or pile driving her buddies into a pile of dung, their bloodlust going offensively unsatiated. Unless their husband died like a moron that is. In that case, in a very un middle ages twist, women were expected to fulfill all their husband's knightly duties. This included protecting their new lord and making sure his land didn't fall into disrepair repair. Only women didn't get any of the cool stuff that came with it, like respect or equality or acknowledgement by history. They got armor though, which
which is pretty sick. Unsurprisingly, the wives seldom waited for their husbands to get gored by a lance before getting all up in the business of running the show. He could literally drop at any time, so homegirl had to be ready. This resulted in night wives actually being significantly more skilled and diplomatically inclined than their husbands. The duties generally expected of a knight's wife included everything from organizing the defenses of their state to arranging marriages for their servants. This was on top of being at beck and call for their husbands 24 hours a day. I wonder how many of these men really met their ends of their own accord, and how many met their end when she didn't need him anymore. It has the effect Taco Bell has on the average 21st century person. Dentistry. Dentistry is a disease caused by tainted food and drink, causing intestinal inflammation leading to excessively frequent and uncontrollable diarrhea to the point of death. So yeah, Taco Bell. Generally, no one was safe. A fact 15th century Italian polymath Girolamo Savona, the Savonarola made clear when he observed that dentistry affected not only in the same house, but in the entire locale and moving from a child of 10 or 15 to a sexagenarian. Savonarola himself came down with the disease in 1495. Now this included knights, battling knights. On English invasion of France, King Henry II had brought a well-trained and disciplined army who were riddled with this disease. The tough-tested veterans could handle the fever and the fatigue, but the constant loss of bowel control presented a massive stinky problem on the eve of an already ominous battle. So the English set up their position on one side of a narrow field, which lay between two forested areas. The narrow approach allowed the limited number of men-at-arms to stretch across the front, while the archers took stationary positions on the flanks angled inward with a row of protective stakes in front. Thanks to their stationary positions, the archers suffering from dentistry simply dropped their pants and shot their arrows. They also dipped their arrows in it to add insult to injury as the world's worst psychological and bio-warfare duo. I mean, can you imagine an arrow covered in that flying at you? Yeah, they won. By a lot. And topping our list is a reminder that our mental well-being is not solely a thing of the present. It's PTSD. From crime statistics and letters of pardons, historians can see that people in the Middle Ages were no more violent than we are today. And yes, they exercised it in its most extreme forms, but this violence was not through nature nor culture, rather simple direction. Whilst following their orders, those battle experiences could leave them with a very serious case of PTSD. This is backed up by a book that was actually written by a knight who lived in the first half of the 14th century. His name was Girofe de Charny, and he was one of the most respected knights of his age. The book about the life of a knight actually includes the psychological consequences. These symptoms ring true of PTSD. In his book, De Charny advises knights on how to relate to the fact that they must kill people when they are at war, how to mentally endure the hardships knights face, poor sleep, hunger, emotional numbness, loneliness, and a feeling that even nature is going against them. Modern military psychology enables us to read medieval texts like these, or ones of Egypt or Greek battles, and the Mongols spread all in a new way, giving us insight into the perception of violence in the Middle Ages in the general population. In history, we've had a horrible habit of misinterpreting. Easy mistake as inflection doesn't appear on paper or stone or stone tablets. Previously, medieval texts were read as worshipping heroes and glorifying violence, but in the light of modern military psychology, we can see the mental cost to knights and of their participation in the gruesome and extreme violent wars in the Middle Ages. Kicking off the list at number 10, Together at Last. Remember when you were a kid and your mom would bump into their friend at the grocery store? That was the worst. While they caught up for what seemed like hours, you were bored out of your mind just staring at like bags of rice and cleaning detergent. That's when the shrew's fiddle comes in. Two women would be locked together, hands included, and face each other. All because they were too loud or they were arguing. These were used in the Middle Ages, most commonly in Germany and Austria, and the contraption would have three holes, one for each wrist and the third for your neck. Now sometimes they would attach a bell to these shrew's fiddles to alert the town that the victim was walking by, you know, in order to talk smack, maybe huck a tomato or two. But the double fiddle, that was the worst. You weren't released until the argument had settled. Some families have an argument shirt where they put the two little siblings in and they can't take the shirt off until they get along. This is like a horrible medieval ages version of that. Much, much more uncomfortable. Not made of cotton. Or funny. Just bad. Just all bad. Number nine, point blank period. All right, babes, let's try not to shudder, but let's talk about periods for a second. 
Aunt Flo, the Red Sea, Shark Week. So many names to describe a pretty sucky time for people who get their period, right? Well, it might suck these days, but back in the medieval times, it was a hell of a lot worse. They just didn't have the same kinds of resources that we have today, so a lot of people had to use their noodle to figure out how to get by. Period products weren't really a thing back then, so people had to get creative. They would use rags or other linens to fashion a pad, but underwear also wasn't really all that popular yet, so they had to find a way to keep things in place. They would also sometimes fashion a makeshift medieval tampon of sorts where they would wrap cotton fabric around a twig and shove it up their hoo-ha. Sounds mighty uncomfortable if you ask me. Some people would also seek out bog moss because it was remarkably absorbent, so they would make their period products out of that sometimes too. This type of moss garnered the name blood moss because of its use in treating wounds and use in period products. For other people who just couldn't create these kinds of things, they would just resort to wearing red the whole time, so everything just kind of blended in. Menstruation, but make it fashion. Number eight, the ducking stool. This next one requires so much effort as like a team. I can't believe this was a real thing. The ducking stool was made to punish women involved in sexual activities. How dare you? Shame. Men were punished too, but if we know anything about history, it was mostly women who had to put up with this shit. There was first the standard ducking stool, so women would have to sit in this chair, strapped down while sitting outside of their home, or they were carried down the street. Humiliation at its finest. The town would be like, that sucks. Can you believe it? Let's take the day off work and embarrass them now. Losers, they're the losers. So stupid, so backwards. The second version of the ducking stool was essentially the same thing, only it was ducked into a river over and over and over again to cool her moderate heat. At least that's what French writer Francois Maximilien Misson says. They should cool off all those angry villagers, if anything. I don't know, dip them in the river. They're the ones burning with rage because somebody who lives over there had sex once. It's really weird, go home, relax. At number seven, Satan's incarnate. Back in the medieval age, women were very much oppressed and incredibly misunderstood. I mean, they thought so many women were witches, and as time went on, the criteria for diagnosing a woman with witchitis or whatever got bigger and bigger to the point where literally any woman could be accused of being a witch for the most BS reasons. Back then, people thought that women were Satan's incarnate, and so they were predisposed to sin, and therefore, they had to be witches. Logic, not quite present, but go off, I guess. There were four reasons why a woman could be considered part of the devil's posse. One, because it was believed that women are foolish and gullible, which is why they turned to magic. Two, because women are insatiable when it comes to their carnal pleasures, and so they seek out help from the devil to satiate their needs. Three, because women talk a lot and we speak lies, apparently. And four, because women are weak, and the only way we can seek revenge is by using magic powers and spells. Now what in the balls is this all about? I don't know. Maybe men in medieval times were just jealous that they couldn't kiki it up with the devil, or because they knew deep down that women run the world. Number six, nosy neighbor. If you were a man back in the Middle Ages and you had an affair, well, you would have to pay a fine. And then that's it. You would go back to your life. But if you're a woman, like everything else on this insane list, it was so, so much worse. Affairs happen a lot, okay? It's normal. Remember that Ashley Madison scandal back in 2015? It sucks, but also it's not surprising at all. This isn't news to us. Back in the Middle Ages, women were treated the worst for these affairs. They would take their noses off. They would literally take a woman's nose and or ears off of their face because they had an affair. Frederick II used to punish adulterers by using renotomy. That was the removal of one's nose. The whole point of this was to make the victim unattractive. Isn't that the worst thing you've ever heard? This is a real thing people did, swear to God. Thing is, nobody is running around confessing that they're cheaters. Somebody has clearly spilled the beans, so they knew what was gonna happen if they got caught, yet they would still rat each other out. Meanwhile, the guy just pays a small fee. Snitches get stitches, just saying. Number five. Arming squire. Being a knight, obviously it sounds cool. They have the sword, the horse, the flowing hair, whatever. They're saving the damsel in distress. Sometimes they lose a hand like Jamie Lannister. Spoilers, you had 10 years. But that's just what being a knight is, right? It wasn't always a fairy tale epic being a knight. I mean, first of all, this process starts when you're young. When you were seven years old, you would be given to a noble to learn for seven more years. And then at age 14, quick maths, at age 14, you would become a squire. A squire is a knight's intern, not an ideal job to have when you're 
a wee lad, but it's a job in the medieval times nonetheless. Can't complain. Also, you had no choice. Get going. Arming squires, they had a lot of responsibility. Arming squires would repair a knight's armor while they were still wearing it, you know? Which buckle was it? Oh, okay, that one. Ugh, it's pretty wet and damp. Yeah, fixing up chainmail on a grown man's thigh. That ought to suck. Welcome to the Dark Ages. Also, after these epic, messy battles, arming squires would have to clean everything off their armor. Everything, yeah. A lot of yuck, and this was long before Dawn soap was ever a thing, so they had to clean with urine. Yeah, it gets worse and worse, doesn't it? Welcome to medieval times, moving on. Number four. Jesters. The earliest account of the fool, they go back to the 11th century. Now these fools were hired to liven up the party. Most of you may have an image of a jester in your head, jumping on tables, telling jokes, farting on your aunt and uncle. It's pretty accurate. That was his job. Pretty cool. It was one of the best jobs to have, all things considered back then, this title of a minstrel or a fool. It was an honor to have. The fool's payment was also no joke. Roland Le Pature, he was rewarded with 30 acres of land from King Henry II. As long as he showed up to court every year, on Christmas Day to fart around. Literally, he would whistle, jump around, and actually fart. And in doing so, he had acres of land. That was loaded, because he was just farting on people. Imagine eating beans on Christmas Day, having a nice time with your family, and then Roland jumps on the table, starts farting on your grandma, then he leaps back over to his mansion. I hate this, I hate the dark ages. Let's move on, I'm getting angry. Tell no one. Number three, groom of the stool. Nowadays, higher ups in the office, they have assistants grab your coffee for you, maybe they answer some phone calls, keep the business running while you're off golfing. You know, whatever you wanna do. Assistants are vital. The groom of the stool, that was a bit much when it comes to assistants. So what I did there, assistants. We have some labor laws put in place now that I don't think we're gonna see an online job opening for a groom of the stool anytime soon. But hey, who knows? Fingers crossed, I'd love to see this again. That's pretty funny. Back in the dark ages, this role was vital and respected. It was created by King Henry VIII. Now this role was to assist the king, specifically to assist his bowel movements, his activities, his big old king <sighs> sessions. You had a box that you had to carry at all times. Now that was where um, all the magic happened in said box, the dark magic that is. And you would literally follow the king around until he needed to use this box, because porta potties weren't a thing back then, and there's no way you're gonna catch a king squatting in the woods, so now we're here. Now this is your job. In fact, you wouldn't even find that king wiping his own behind. That chore was also reserved for the groom of the stool. You're probably thinking, Taylor, which poor soul had to be stuck with this role? A prisoner? Somebody who lost their sense of smell, hopefully, ideally? No, only sons of noblemen could take on this role. And in doing so, they also gained access to every room, tons of clothes, and any bedchamber furnishings in a castle. And of course, high pay, thank God. Okay, maybe I would do it, that's not bad. Would you wipe an ass for a castle, Chris? Probably, right, not bad. You wipe your own for, you know, for no, for no castle, so that's fine. We can get you a castle. Number two, dentist, barber, surgeon combo. Get three appointments in one, all in 10 minutes or less. How lucky are you to be alive in the dark ages? Back then, dentists were not a thing. You weren't gently encouraged to floss more. You didn't have a fun chair that went back real slow. But they did have solutions. They had one solution, and that was to pull everything. Cavity, gone. Toothache, see you later. Maybe you accidentally bit a rock, you chipped a molar. Eh, doesn't matter. We're going to pull it all regardless. They would only pull your teeth out. Barbers were responsible for cutting hair, pulling teeth, and bloodletting. I'm like, perfect, I need all of those today. What are the odds? They would use tools like forceps, pliers, and scraping instruments, all to address dental issues. However, and believe it or not, their practices lacked advanced techniques and understanding of modern dentistry. You don't say. Three jobs in one, yeah, I wonder how long that took to graduate. That's a hefty program right there. So like, oh, it's 18 years, you're gonna love it. Yeah, no pay, it's good. And finally, number one, the beard tax. Here we go, you may have heard about the cheese tax, but have you heard about the beard tax? This is good, I would've been fine. I really tried earlier this year, couldn't do it, but I'm bald guy forever, that's cool. I would've saved money in the dark ages. My God, I would've had like savings, would've been a good, great time. The beard tax emerged in certain regions as a means of gathering revenue and enforcing social norms. Men were required to pay a tax based on the length of their beards and in some cases, even the width or the shape. They're like, we don't like that. Give us $5 right now. Lice infestations were a common problem due to the limited access of personal hygiene and sanitary practices. You know, men bathing together, pitching ideas, didn't help. However, the length and density of beards provided a natural barrier against lice. So it was believed that back then, the oils present in the beard's hair made it difficult for lice to crawl around and survive. Therefore, men often grew their beards as long as they could to prevent lice infestation. 
That's why Vikings had such big, long, gray beards. I take that back. I actually would have been screwed back then. I would have been so itchy. I'm itchy now just thinking about it. I'm getting out of here. See you. All right, let's get going with how you're weird for drinking water. Because it's actually not true that water wasn't drinkable, just that people tended to get sick from drinking still water and they knew it. And they knew boiling said still water would make it drinkable the way that spring water and natural well water were. People prefer to drink cold water rather than hot and there was the paranoia that if the water cooled back down, it would become unsafe to drink again. So an alternative was to make something out of it if you don't want to drink hot water all season long. Thus beer. The end product of the boiled barley mix would endure storage for weeks or months, its taste would improve with time, and it was better than drinking steamy hot water all day. Two batches would be produced from the same mash. The first was a full strength beer, the second was lower in alcohol, and that was consumed more throughout the day while working or when you're just thirsty. So yes, while water was available, beer still was the bev of choice. People thought that you were either a nutcase or just highly devout religious if water was your go-to. One account by the Gallo-Roman historian Saint Gregory mentions a boy so religious he primarily drank water. Ooh, shocking. Our next title is all about titles because the medieval, middle, whatever ages were all about titles more so than any other time in European history. Think about it. I mean, they literally called the system feudalism because of the constant feuding between higher titles. Kings delegated power among their trusted subordinates. So dukes are under kings and they rule duchies, counts are under them and they rule counties, the clergy's under them and they rule religious institutions, the mayors are under them and they rule cities, and then the aldermen are under those guys and they rule the villages. These rulers and other wealthy landowners make up the nobility. Below the nobility are the typical citizens, and below them are the serfs, the ones who are hard laborers indebted to nobles. Nowadays you can come from a small slum town and work your way up to Hollywood fame just using an iPhone and a ring light. Back then, if you were alderman rank or below, there is not much hope for you. You're locked into your social stature for life. A lot of us are probably feeling cocky, feeling like that's survivable. You forget the entitlement you have in your day-to-day -day lives. Because living back then, everything is a debt. Ah, you may be wondering, Teresa, how is that any different from now? Society is crumbling, inflation has destroyed the young generations. Well, let me tell you how status and debt in medieval times was just as much, if not more, of a prison than nowadays digital credit system. So now that you understand the system of titles, back to the average Joe, the peasant. Chances are you're a farmer, but you don't have any tools and you don't own the land either. The nobles have both the tools and the land. In order to actually farm, you gotta go to your local noble and he gives you the land and tools. In exchange, you give him a portion of your crops. Usually this is about 50 to 75% of what you grow. So if you grow about an acre of crops, you have just enough to feed yourself and your family and pay the noble. Now if you choose this life, which you will if you want to survive, you're going to miss a couple of payments to said noble, putting you in debt to him, thus a serf. Meanwhile, your local duke wants to raise an army to conquer the neighboring duke's land. He has to get the approval of the counts under him and the counts have to get the approval of the landowners. This is because like you, the landowners don't actually own the land. Their duke does. The duke doesn't own the land either. The king does. The landowner sends some of the crops he takes from you to the duke already. But now he has another responsibility for him. He has to raise his army. Can you guess where this army comes from? That's right. It's you. Welcome to paying a debt with your life. But don't worry. Being in battle isn't all bad. Look at why they invented chivalry. In 21st century, the word chivalry evokes a kind of old-fashioned male respect for women. But in early Middle Ages, church councils were literally praying to be delivered from knights. And by the late 11th century, early 12th, it was decided they straight up needed laws to govern these guys. Knights were essentially hired thugs dressed in tin cans on horses and were commanded by warlords after all. How great do you expect them to be? They were rewarded with land or the license to plunder the villages Game of Thrones style, looting, forcing themselves on women, killing the innocent, burning it down. But a lot of the time they didn't wait for that to be rewarded. Knights were known to terrorize villages and towns they came across as if they were bandits. For example, in 1379, Sir John Ardendell rode to a covenant and asked the nuns to put him up for a few nights. After they agreed, he and his armed men looted the nunnery, stormed a nearby church, stole a newly married bride, forced themselves upon her, kidnapped the nuns, take them out to sea, and throw everybody overboard. At a time where routine night violence with massive citizen casualties were happening, chivalry was an effort to set ground rules for nightly behavior. While these rules sometimes dictated generous treatment of the less fortunate, they were focused mainly on protecting the interests of the elite. Hope you're one of those, otherwise you might uh, die because a sociopath on a horse is bored. And now for the vast nothingness. There was nobody for miles 
From childhood as far as your eyes can see outside of your house, other houses, and about 200 people, there is nothing. Just nothing. You lived and died seeing the same thing every day with only a few excuses to travel out into the world. In 1086, there were 1 million people living in all of England compared with the 53 million today. By the 1300s, this had climbed to 4 mil, but the Black Death wiped out about 1.5 mil of those people between 1348 and 1350, meaning many villages were completely decimated or just abandoned. Traveling parties in medieval Europe were not exactly rolling in options for transportation means when it came time to travel. Horses, carts, human feet. And that last one was by far the most common. There were a lot of reasons why even the average peasant may travel. In England between 600 AD and 1485, these included going to mass because early villages didn't really have their own churches. Or attendance at the local court, which was compulsory for all free men once a month. Payments of taxes to the royal manor four times a year. But just short of going to the neighboring big town, most never really left their homes or their home community. Women especially, they weren't seen to have much purpose outside of their front door. But sometimes you can say I do and have a whole ceremony and still have to prove it. In the Middle Ages, getting married was easy for Christians living in Western Europe. According to the church, which created and enforced marriage law, couples didn't need permission of their families or priests to officiate until towards the end of the 18th century. And though the church controlled or tried to control marriage, couples didn't need to marry in a church until the 18th century. So medieval legal records show people getting married on the road, down at the pub, at a friend's house, in bed, really anywhere. All that was required for a valid binding marriage was the consent of the two people involved. So while tying the knot can take a matter of moments, proving you were married is a different story. The vast majority of marriage cases that came up before the courts were to enforce or prove that a marriage had been taken place in the first place. And marriage mix-ups bothered the clergy since after much debate, theologians decided in the 12th century that marriage was a holy sacrament. The union of man and woman in marriage and intercourse represented the union of Christ in the church, and this was hardly symbolism to be taken lightly now. So they wrote up some laws and dished them out. The statutes issued by the English church in 1217 to 1219 include warnings such as no man should place a ring of reeds or another material, vile or precious, on the young woman's hands in jest, so that he might more easily fornicate with them. Lest he thinks himself to be joking, he pledge himself to the burden of of matrimony. Another thing in those statutes was hold that peace. Not your pee though, I know it sounded similar, but you can do that on the streets anywhere. It's medieval times. Beautiful. Anywho, the bonds I mentioned earlier were introduced as part of the 1215 changes to try and flush out any impediments before a marriage took place. This could be someone is already married, or she's not a or he's wanted for killing someone. There is range. Nevertheless, until the Reformation, there was no speak now or forever hold your peace. In the Middle Ages, problems discovered or revealed after marriage could have an enormous impact still. For example, Joan of Kent, who's remembered as Edward the Black Prince's wife and the mother of the future King Richard II, was married in her early teens. It was a whole Diana level spectacle with full publicity, a church service, her new boo was an aristocrat. But after about eight years of marriage, this marriage was overturned in the papal court and she was returned to a knight she had secretly married without her family's knowledge or approval when she was 12. Imagine that, spend eight years with a dude only to be shipped back to some idiot I said I love you to when you were 12. If that still happened nowadays, we'd all be locked in with our first crushes. Take a minute please and soak that horrible thought in. Anyways, it's difficult to know how many medieval people married for love or found love in their arranged marriage. There was certainly a distinction between free consent to marry and having a completely free choice. Now circling back to my earlier point where I explained the wedding day, how about the wedding night? Not a moment alone is next. Alright y'all have officially tied the knot and locked lips for the first time. You did some praying, now it's time for a meal, pretty normal stuff that lines up with nowadays. The peasant couple celebrated with their friends and family, drinking bridal ale for this special occasion and eating a meal traditionally made up of dishes brought by the wedding guests to help feed the community. That's right y'all, like a trailer park wedding, medieval receptions were potlucks. After the reception of the peasant couple may dance and enjoy their night, but a royal couple is ushered to the chamber to consummate the marriage in bed ASAP. The priest, the clergy, parents, really whoever wanted in on the act 
reaction would come into the room, kick their feet up, and have some popcorn and tell the couple, give us a show here. The bride needed to be a virgin at the time too, which had to be proven by blood being on the bed sheets. If there wasn't any, the whole wedding could be undone on the spot, which actually would be really hard for those women who don't bleed their first times. They do exist. And of course, because there isn't those enough people in the room while your cherry's getting popped as is, a medieval wedding tradition allowed unmarried guests from the procession to also follow royal newlyweds into the room and take turns throwing the bride and groom stockings at them. Whoever managed to make a direct hit would presumably get married soon. Yeah, this is where the bouquet toss comes from. Then someone has to go retrieve it off the naked sweaty couple so someone else can have a throw. Truly a magical time of wedding traditions. Imposed witnesses, parental consent, church weddings. Yes, it was because of the confusing I do issue and a bunch of others I've listed, but it was also because of kidnap. So over the last 20 years, historians have increasingly problematized consent we've heard of in the past, warning us not to project modern understanding of consent onto that medieval canon law. Today, consent is defined by what is present instead of what is absent. Yes means yes instead of no means no. In medieval times, the gap between coercion and consent was essentially a hairline. Women didn't have many legal options to deal with very persuasive or dangerous men who demanded their hand and would stop at nothing to achieve it. And consequently, the women often agreed to marry them for fear of their life. Because stopping at nothing often led to being captured. And with women being property, if said captor managed to return home and take the woman against her will before a brother, father, knight, whoever can do something about it, she becomes his property. These abductions then regularly end in marriage because of the damage of the deflowering caused to the victim's reputation. She'd never be wanted by anyone else, and so the POS who can't understand the word no wins. To delineate between consent and coercion, canon laws dropped in the 1200s stated that the degree of pressure applied on an individual could not sway a constant man or woman, meaning that neither family members, romantic partner, a stranger, anyone could exert pressure on an individual to force their consent. However, the degree to which force is interpreted and is defined by each city or community, some communities stay stuck in old ways. And last, but never the least, is apparently you can be two into your wife. So, marriage aside from being a means of property exchange was also used by the church to regulate adult activities and carnal desires of the everyday person. Because any intercourse outside of marriage was a universal sin, but intercourse in marriage is only acceptable for procreation. Which means the church is trying to peddle that a good intimacy relationship was beneficial to your marriage, but neither desire nor pleasure should be involved or play a role in it. Because that's physically possible. They took this serious too, man. Like Thomas Aquinas warned that a man who slept with his wife solely for pleasure was treating her like a lady of the night. And St. Jerome stated in the fourth century that a man who is too passionately in love with his wife is an adulterer. This is a sentiment which remained pre prevalent up until the end of the 16th century. Not only was the purpose of intercourse within marriage made abundantly clear by the church, and still is, but there were many rules and regulations pertaining to the act itself. Like when the activity between the husband or wife was or wasn't permitted. That would be like a feast or fast day, Sundays, menstruation or pregnancy, while breastfeeding, and for 40 days after childbirth, also holidays, and holy days. This meant that on average, most married couples could illegally have intercourse less than once a week. Negative one time a week, you guys. But at least we had champs like Albert the Great who would throw ladies the proverbial bone every now and then. He defended women's carnal desires during pregnancy actually in a document, claiming that the fetus stimulated desire in women. A woman never desires relations so much as she does when she is pregnant. Medicine is most needed in the time of greatest illness. First up, since we've heard a decent bit about nights before, let's start with training day. Or days, uh, well, years. The joke still landed, whatever. Training for nights began began around age seven, and it would take an average of 14 years before they were ready to battle. Essentially like going to middle and high school today. And like the school system, you moved up through the levels. Potential knights started as pages, who essentially acted as an assistant or servant to their assigned lord. Most of the training for pages began practicing with dull weapons, learning to master riding a horse, take part in hunts, and otherwise do menial tasks. At 14, pages would become squires, assuming they were still in good physical health and not a raging socio or psychopath. According to medieval Britain, once a page became a squire, he had to master the seven points of agility, which was just a really long list of sporting events. So 
things like shooting, fencing, wrestling, riding horses, swimming and diving, climbing, long jumping, tournament sports like jousting and dancing. Okay, so that's more than seven points of agilities and dancing was in there, so let's just agree that medieval logic was a bit strange and their math skills were bad and we can move on. After approximately five to seven years of this higher training, if they survived and had mastered all the required skills, they'd usually be officially knighted and that's usually at age 19 to 22. You weren't taught to have your own opinions, but people are people and that's why sometimes a knight had to battle their conscience. As a knight, you were serving God. But what did that mean? A knight could go his whole life without having the clouds overhead opening up and God sticking his head through to yell specific directions at him out of everyone on earth to choose from. So he had to turn elsewhere for guidance. Okay, so what do we got here? Well, there's, there's the priest, or you could ask the king who by virtue was a direct mouthpiece of God, which by the way is super convenient to be packing when you want to do things like seduce courtiers or chop off people's heads. God said I could, ha ha. But this also means a knight is always beholden to kings and that mouthpiece of his. Whether or not the orders agreed with the knight's conscience, the orders came from God and he was dedicated to that God. So what happened to knights who disobeyed that or somehow dishonored themselves? The ones who the king hits up and said, yo, I'm gonna have your wife tonight or go execute this blind person for bumping into me. And their response was anything other than, oh yeah, 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 man, do whatever you want. Well, a king gave the knight his spurs so he could also take him away. According to noble dynasty, when a knight who did something treasonous or cowardly, let me uh, correct, was just accused of doing something treasonly or cowardly because there didn't have to be proof, he got publicly stripped of knighthood in a formal ceremony, then executed. And seeing as being a knight meant that could happen at any second, X marks the plot. There must have been those knights with existentialism, the ones who laid up at night wondering if all the infidel killing and pervy chivalry and pillaging and holy calling stuff, what if it's almost but not enough to get you into heaven? Which means you could do pretty much everything right as a knight and still spend sleepless nights worrying that you wouldn't make it past the pearly gates. They were a super religious lot after all. In anticipation of solving this problem, a lot of knights, well, those who made it past their youth anyway, would often join a military order because membership usually came with a plot in a church graveyard. And seeing as they believed even people who were completely without sin could not be guaranteed a place in heaven unless they were buried in a certain kind of dirt, that's better than a pension. And no, not any dirt would do. It had to be consecrated dirt of a church graveyard. According to ancient history, Cyclopedia, an aging knight would sometimes even enlist at the last possible second for battle so he could be interred beneath a lovely stone effigy in church forever without needing to do or spend any time doing boring churchy stuff. Our world loves class divide and that's no different back then when it sucked to be a poor knight. On that note, contrary to popular belief, not all knights were wealthy with castles and serfs and all that bougie middle age luxury. In fact, some weren't even landowners at all and the rank of knight was more or less something that made one a minor noble like your auntie on city council. Though, of course, many among the knighted held higher positions in nobility separate from their knightly status. This is to do with knight becoming a nepo baby industry. The lowest class of these knights might even live in their lord's homes, serving more or less as bodyguards, security, occasionally law enforcement, and sometimes judges mediating local disputes. In essence, their day to day was a bit of a mashup between soldier and civil law enforcement. It's like those people you met who wanted to become a cop for the fast action and the pew pew and the speed chases, then learn it's 80% paperwork and painfully slow regiment. As you might imagine, lower ranked and poorer knights love tournaments for a chance to gain prestige, practice their skills, and the chance to acquire additional wealth via prizes and ransoms and the like. So tournaments is next on our list because they were essentially medieval mud melees. Since knights started at not-nosed kids, it was easy to build the ideology of tournaments as fun and exciting into them, the foundation of competitiveness. In the 13th century, tournaments were particularly bloody and death was not uncommon. Initially, the games and tournaments were a little more than massive melees, usually including real sharpened weapons, there were no rules, and tensions were made intensely high because often they'd group the knights by nation or clan, then pit them against each other that way. Call whoever had that idea Taylor Swift because they wanted bad blood. That said, the general point, unlike real battle, was not to intentionally kill your opponent, 
opponent, but just to knock them off their horse, steal their armor and horse, and take them prisoner until the tourney is over. That being said, dull weapons weren't introduced into tournaments for hundreds of years, and they also used lances to launch each other off of horses at full speed, so realistically death is inevitable. One notable tournament took place in 1274 when King Edward I was pitted against the Count of Shalons. As the King and the Count battled it out, dozens of soldiers from each side got involved and lost their lives. And these tournaments often took up whole villages. This is because they weren't much different from actual battle, so knights could take off and hide in a peasant's house from the opposing team, which was often then ransacked and burnt. Essentially being a medieval peasant was like living in Avengers Universe New York where at any second your whole house could be obliterated in a blink and you miss it style by a group of battling morons. Number five. Heretic's Fork. Yeah, a lot like this. This one sucked. The medieval Heretic's Fork was a device used during the Inquisition to punish individuals accused of heresy. You hear the wrong stuff and then you say the wrong stuff. No matter what you do, bad punishment awaits. Some fork's going in a place you don't want it to be. This punishment consisted of a long metal fork with two prongs that were placed under the chin and the sternum of the accused, making it so you had to stay upright or else, yeah, not good. The device was designed to keep the person awake and prevent them from speaking and or swallowing, and if they do so, it would cause extreme pain. The prongs here could be adjusted to vary the amount of pressure applied, and the device was often left in place for hours or, again, like the other punishment, even days at a time, which is horrible. The heretic's fork was cruel and it was a form of psychological punishment that was used to extract confessions and punish those who dare to speak out against the church. Yes, how dare thee? Now hold still. Number four, sewer surfing. Uh, it's not as cool as you're imagining, but it's something along those lines. Also known as sewer hunting and or draining, sewer surfing was a popular but illegal activity during the dark ages. and involved navigating through the underground sewage systems of cities, typically for thieves or other illicit activities, trying to find some gold, something, I don't know, something shady going on under the city. Sewer surfing was often punished severely, more than you'd think here. Guys going through garbage, they're like, ah, hang him. It's like, what? what? It was also considered a violation of the law and a danger to public health. You go down there, you come back up with, I don't know, a plague that you found down there? You don't want that. You don't want a rat to bite you. Offenders would face fines, imprisonment, or even the gallows. However, despite the risks and penalties, many people, many people, continued to participate in this dangerous activity as it was their only means of survival or adventure, or money or goods or anything really. It led to numerous arrests and punishments throughout the medieval period. Honestly, Fair. I don't know, you never know. Somebody may have lost a nice pocket watch or maybe you'll find rats and then get really sick. 50-50. I found a pocket watch. Also, the town is violently ill, so I'm rich, sorry. Number three, blasphemy. Blasphemy! You almost have to yell it every time you say it, you know? Blasphemy was considered a serious crime in medieval times. It involved speaking ill or speaking contemptuously about God, Jesus, and or the church. That's a big no-no back then. Big no-no. This was seen as a direct attack <laughs> a direct attack to God and the faith. It was considered a threat to the very fabric of society just because you said some sh Blasphemers could be punished in various ways. At this point, you probably know them. Imprisonment, flogging, and or, well, yeah, just, you're dead now. In some cases, offenders were forced to wear a blasphemer's bridle, which was a metal mask with a spike that was inserted into the offender's mouth, which would, of course, prevent them from speaking more. Blasphemy laws varied across different regions and periods throughout medieval European history, but they all shared a common goal of protecting the sanity of religious beliefs and shoving metal into a human's mouth. All those things were very important to the faith good stuff. Number two, beard tax. I tried to grow a beard for like two weeks and I just, I just immediately bailed on the whole thing. I was like, hey, you'll see me guys, I'll show you. And then I came back, didn't even talk about it. In medieval times, I would have been fine. Honestly, this is a, it's a weird tax. There were periods and regions in medieval history where facial hair was regulated and or frowned upon. Imagine that, right? Guys trying to grow it out, a little, has a little stubble. Everyone's like, ugh. Really, Alexander the Seventh? Really? During the reign of Henry the Eighth in England, a beard tax, a beard tax, cha-ching, was imposed to, well, only men with beards over two weeks old. They were required to pay. If you were day 13, they're like, all right, we'll see you tomorrow. You better figure it out, figure this whole thing out, mister. Vikings, however, what about them? In the Dark Ages, Vikings, they were all about the beards. What happened? Beards, when it came to Vikings, they were highly valued and considered a sign of masculinity and strength. Again, I'd be screwed if it was that time. I'd be good over here, but then I'm a very weak man over here. Know what I mean? No tax and then no muscle. Taylor McWaters, no tax and no muscle. 
<laughs> and finally, number one, not reporting a dead body. Yeah, we've all seen Stand By Me. This can lead to some problems, some troublesome things. This last one here is pretty obvious in theory, but the way that they handled it back then was pretty crazy. We're not doing it the same today. Thank God. Thank the church and the lords. In medieval times, roughly around 1240, the law surrounding the discovery of a dead body, ha, huh, surprise, what's this? Who is this? This varied depending on the region and the time period. But generally, if somebody discovered a, ha, huh, who is this uh, skeleton? What's this? Generally, at that time, they required to report it to the courts or the lords. The lords, you know the lords, go tell the lords. Failure to do so could result in punishment, as of course, it was considered suspicious behavior. Fair, okay, fair. More often than not, the person who found the body, they would be asked to provide information about the circumstances surrounding the death, including any and all possible suspects. Yeah, so uh, take a guess. He had wood teeth, he looked old and medieval. I don't know, he was someone. In some cases, the finder may have been entitled to a reward for discovering the body, but in other cases, you yourself could be charged with the death. So 50-50, yeah, might get some money, might go to jail. If that was me, I'd be like, nope, I didn't see a thing, sir. I was just looking up at space, wondering what that big rock in the sky is. I don't know what gravity is. All women are witches, right, brother? Cheers, <laughs> didn't see anything.